Hey everyone, this is my first audio recording with the system rebuild, so I hope it goes well. Feel free to leave me some feedback if there's any issues. I thought of this case recently as I'm pulling together a YSL timeline for those of you who asked for a summary of the case, which, wow, that's an undertaking. It reminded me of this case. I ran this case, oh gosh, a year and a half ago when I was in YouTube jail for doing exactly what almost all of these new pop-up channels, court channels are doing. And that was putting out content without adding significant commentary, changes, editing, things of that nature. So I was sidelined for a while and this was one of the things that I did to keep us busy. In this case, there was a group of fraternity brothers that were having a party and things got a little heated, things got a little out of hand. Apparently, like adult fraternity parties are just as wild as college fraternity parties. And towards the end of the night, there was a altercation that led to a gunshot. One person was shot and the bullet ricocheted off the ground and hit a second person. So two people were ultimately shot by the one action. The party occurred in the spring of 2022. Mr. Thomas, Philip Thomas, who was a athletic director at Moorhead College, I believe, in Georgia, was charged in November of 2022. And his charges were aggravated battery, two counts of aggravated assault, one for each of the people who were injured by the bullet, two counts of possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. So kind of odd charges that he has two of those as well. Anyways, they'll discuss that. So there were a couple motions on the table that Judge McBurney, who's amazing, will dispense with right away. And then the main motion that they're doing in this hearing is the motion for immunity based on self-defense. And that's a pretty hefty argument. Unless you are watching the premiere of this, please feel free to skip ahead if you don't want to listen to me read the motion that was filed, which kind of gives you some background information. There are chapters, chapter links in the description, and they should be on your screen as well. Just to lay out the players in this, the defendant is Mr. Philip Thomas. He is one of the fraternity brothers and was attending the party at the home of Mr. Swain. Mr. Swain is also a fraternity brother and friend to all. I'm, I, I'm not sure. He kind of interconnects everybody. It was his party. Mr. Kendrick Cooper is in a different fraternity that's related. I don't understand all the fraternity stuff. I apologize. I tried to. I really tried to understand it during this, but it's like lines and links and whose orders and whew. now the primary conflict was between Mr. Thomas and Mr. Cooper. Mr. Thomas shot at Mr. Cooper as he was charging towards him. The bullet went through his midsection, I believe, ricocheted off the ground and then hit Mr. Swain in the leg. So those were the two injuries that he was charged with the assault on. So now his attorneys have filed the motion for immunity under OCGA 16 dash three dash 24.2 comes now Philip Thomas by and through undersigned counsel in the above styled matter and pursuant to OCGA 16324.2, the rights enumerated in OCGA one dash two dash six, the fifth and 14th amendments to the United States constitution and the concomitant provisions of the Georgia constitution, including article one, section one, paragraph one, two, 11, 14, 18, and 29. Boy, I had to reach for those. That was way back in the memory banks. And moves this court to dismiss the above entitled and numbered, numbered, numerated. Anyways, case and send back the case to the prosecution, which must be charged on amended self-defense statutes and any exculpatory evidence that relates to defendant's self-defense assertion. In the alternative, the defendant requests the court uphold an evidentiary hearing on the issue of whether the defendant is immune from criminal prosecution. And based upon the determination, dismiss the case and prohibit further criminal prosecution. In support of this motion, defendant shows the following. That's what we want. Defendant was indicted on charges of aggravated battery, aggravated assault times two, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony on November 17th, 2022 in Fulton County. On May 16th, 2022, Mr. Philip Thomas was leaving a party with his fraternity brothers when Mr. Kendrick Cooper, the state's alleged victim, charged at Mr. Thomas as he stood by his vehicle with a friend, Mr. Swain. That's the homeowner. After being a public nuisance all night, Mr. Cooper charged at Mr. Thomas, stating, inward, I'm a kill you, motherfucker. As Mr. Cooper charged at Mr. Thomas, 
he had one hand behind his back. Mr. Swain attempted to stop Mr. Cooper from physically assaulting Mr. Thomas. However, Mr. Cooper overpowered Mr. Swain. As Mr. Cooper got closer to Mr. Thomas, he raised his hand from behind his back in defense of himself. Mr. Thomas fired one shot to stop Mr. Cooper, but unfortunately, it also struck Mr. Thomas's friend, Mr. Swain. Immediately following the shot, Mr. Thomas rendered aid. Providing all citizens of Georgia immunity from criminal prosecution and asserting their right to self-defense, the Georgia legislature passed OCGA 16-3-24.2, which states the following, a person who uses threats or force in accordance with code section 16-3-21, 16-3-23, 16-3-23.1, or 16-3-24 shall be immune from criminal prosecution. Therefore, unless in the use of deadly force, such person utilizes a weapon the carrying or possession of which is unlawful by such person under part two or three of the article four of chapter 11 of this title, Georgia laws, 2006 act five, nine, nine Senate bill three, nine, six. So many numbers. My brain is mush. In other words, one who uses force and self-defense in accordance with OCGA 16, is now immune from prosecution. Footnote one. Okay. OCGA 16324.2 is to be construed to bar criminal prosecutions of persons using force as set forth in 16321, the right to self defense, and 16323.1, the right to stand one's ground. So Georgia has both the right to self defense and stand your ground law. OCGA 16320, justification as a defense, and 16328, affirmative defense, are also essential to the grand jury's determination of immunity from prosecution. According to the Court of Appeals, one who is immune is exempt or free from criminal action, a proceeding instituted and carried on by due course of law, according to Boggs v. State. In construing OCGA 16324.2, the Supreme Court of Georgia held by the plain meaning of immune from prosecution and other language in the statute, the statute must be construed to bar criminal proceedings against persons who use force under the circumstances set forth in OCGA 16.3. Can't they? We need like a nickname, like OCGA. First one, second one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> According to Fair v. State, that's a lot to read over and over again. Miss Thomas, ooh, typo. Mr. Thomas may now be immune from prosecution and he requests, requests this court to hold an evidentiary hearing and decide the issue of whether the defendant is immune from further criminal prosecution. The first remedy defendant seeks would be for the court to dismiss the case based on the immunity statute 24.2 in accordance with the above. In People v. Cruz-Sanchez, the prosecutor charged the grand jury on justification, but failed to instruct the grand jury on the provision that the actor is under no duty to retreat if he or she is, I, in his or her own dwelling and not the initial aggressor at 857. As a result, the court dismissed the indictment holding the inaccurate and incomplete instruction given here, which implied that the defendant had a duty to retreat when he may well have been under no such duty, impaired the integrity of the proceedings to the prejudice of the defendant. The court reasoned that if the grand jury was not instructed on the defense, that would eliminate a needless or unfounded prosecution of the proceeding as defective, mandating dismissal of the indictment. So their first argument is the grand jury was not given the appropriate instruction that he had no duty to retreat, but he was not in his own home. So let's see how they explain that. In Cruz Sanchez, the grand jury heard evidence that the defendant was sitting on a porch that was part of his dwelling as he was approached and accosted by the complainant. The court held that because this evidence supported an instruction on justification, the grand jury was required to hear the no duty to retreat law. In the case at hand, the evidence supported an instruction on justification concerning the defendant's fear for her life. Well, yep, nope, it's a he. Yet no instruction on the justification defense, let alone justification law, was given. That's the problem with copy-paste. I mean, it, it's, it's good because it saves you time, but boy, those hers and hims are hard to catch. While U.S. v. Williams held that the government does not have a duty to disclose exculpatory evidence in its possession to the grand jury, the case at hand presents an entirely different and unique situation. The case at hand is more analogous to U.S. v. Levin, where it was proper for the district court to dismiss the indictment in ruling on a motion by making preliminary findings of facts and the concluding as a matter of law that the government was incapable of proving that the required element of intent necessary to support the conviction. 
the court in Levine held that a defense is capable of determination if trial of the facts surrounding the commission of the alleged defense would be of no assistance in determining the validity of the defense, quoting U.S. v. Covington, where the defense of self-incrimination to a marijuana tax act provided defendant a complete defense to the prosecution as the defense was timely raised, was not waived, and there was no possibility of factual dispute regarding the hazard of incrimination. The defendant was entitled to dismissal of the indictment as a result. Analogous to Levine, trial of the facts surrounding the alleged offense are of no assistance in determining the validity of the self-defense statute and the no-duty-to-retreat statute because the legislature provided that a defendant who is entitled to immunity from criminal prosecution under 16.3.24.2 must be provided relief prior to trial. Mr. Thomas was forced to defend himself when Mr. Cooper threatened to kill him as Mr. Cooper charged with his hand behind his back at Mr. Thomas. OCGA 16.3.21 provides that a person is justified and thus has a defense to prosecution under OCGA 16.3.20 in using force against another that is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm only if he reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent death or great bodily harm to himself. B, a person is not justified in using force if he, three, was the aggressor or was engaged in combat by agreement. Section 16.321A provides in part that a person is justified in threatening or using force against another when and to the extent that he or she reasonably believes that such threat or force is necessary to defend himself or herself or a third person against the other's imminent use of unlawful force, hip v. state. This court must hold a pretrial hearing on the issue of immunity when a defendant asserts immunity from prosecution under 16.324.2, as the statute provides that a such a person shall be immune from criminal prosecution. The decision as to whether a person is immune must be determined by the trial court as a matter of law before the trial of that person commences. And that cites Fair v. State and Boggs v. State. The trial judge must determine the issue of immunity prior to the commencement of the trial. Fair, Supra, Boggs, Supra. The decision as to whether a person is immune must be determined by the trial court before the trial commences. In Boggs, the defendant was entitled to a determination on the question of immunity as a matter of law before the commencement of the trial when he asserted the defense that he was immune from prosecution under 163242. The trial court erred in refusing to rule pretrial on the defendant's motions. The case remanded for a pretrial determination of whether the defendants were entitled to immunity from prosecution. Because the defendant had asserted that she is immune from criminal prosecution, the court must grant pretrial hearing and determine whether she is immune before the trial commences. Additionally, defendant insists that his announcement is not ready for trial until this court has made a ruling on the motion prior to trial. See Lightning v. State. Assuming this court does not dismiss the case and return the case back to prosecution that is instructed on the amendments to the self-defense statutes, the standard to be held at a pretrial hearing is for the defendant to show by a preponderance of the evidence that she is he is entitled to immunity, Bun B. State. To avoid trial, a defendant bears the burden of showing that he is entitled to immunity under 163242 by a preponderance of the evidence. The case remanded with direction to employ preponderance of the evidence standard in deciding the motion for immunity, State v. Yapo. Yapo. Affirming that defendant was immune from prosecution, if battery counts of battery counts, appellate court applied the any evidence standard in reviewing the court's findings of fact. Preponderance of evidence means that the superior weight of the evidence upon the issues involved, which, while not enough to free the mind wholly from the reasonable doubt, is yet sufficient to incline a reasonable and impartial mind to one side of the issue rather than to the other. The defendant has introduced evidence of self-defense and that he is immune from criminal prosecution based on this motion and will further introduce evidence at a pretrial hearing on this matter. Further, the defendant is not required to admit to specific allegations of violence in order to obtain the protection of the statute, according to Yapo. There is no requirement that, Yap that Yapo had to admit to the specific allegations of violence in order to obtain the protection of this statute. The credible testimony of the defendant's girlfriend provided some evidence that Yapo's actions in physically restraining her, whether characterized as choking or bear-hugging, were justified under OCGA 16321A. Thus, OCGA 163242 requires the trial judge to be the trier of fact on the issue of self-defense and whether she is immune from prosecution by the preponderance of the evidence. Therefore, as the facts show, the defendant acted in self-defense in an attempt to prevent his own death or great bodily harm to himself. This court should make a ruling that he is immune and prohibit further criminal prosecution. 
a decision as to whether a person is immune from criminal prosecution under 163242 must be determined by the trial court before the trial of the person commences for the 20th time. The defendant contends that she was justified. That should be a he. Boy, y'all got a proofread, Ms. Foster. And using force against Kendrick Cooper in accordance with 16321, 16323.1, wherefore this defendant requests this court to order a pretrial evidentiary hearing on the issue of immunity and that this defendant be granted immunity from prosecution under OCGA 163242. Respectfully submitted this 21st day of December, 2022. Chinwee. In Foster Esquire, attorney for Philip Thomas. So that is what we are about to enter is the hearing on the request for immunity. And it is going to turn into a two-day hearing, which is quite extensive for this type of hearing, but it's an interesting one. What do we learn, Ms. Hawkins? Um, I received a text message from Ms. Foster Major about seven minutes ago um, that she was parking. She is in a boot. So uh oh. It may take her a little longer to get from the parking deck to. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Costello, why don't you get on the record two things? Um, one, um, reminding me why your office is prosecuting the case. And then two, if there are any procedural steps you need me to take to swear in you and Ms. Jackson. I know there was some back and forth um, between your office and the Fulton DA's office about your ability and Ms. Jackson's ability to appear here. I'm not aware of there being an issue, but I'm happy if I need to say magic words um, to make it so, I will, I will do that. And uh, as much as I like swearing into places, Judge, I don't think that's going to be necessary today. Uh, I spoke with one of our appeals attorneys at the CAB. He called down to the prosecuting attorney's counsel. As long as I have filed an entry with the appointment uh, from the AG's office appointing Madam DA Boston as the DA pro temp in this case, which I have done, I have a copy for your honor and also defense if you would like. Uh, I think that should take care of the, any procedural issues we may have as far as representing the state in this case. Okay, I've seen it. It was the most recent uh, entry in the docket. It was entered yesterday. It's listed as entry of appearance slash appointment of district attorney pro temp. So I, I don't need it, but it's good that you give it to the defense. Thank you, Judge. And um, the source of the conflict in this case, um, briefly on the facts, it's a shooting case. Uh, the defendant allegedly made statements to a witness um, who works for the Fulton County DA's office. Those are incriminating statements. Uh, that employee would become a material witness for the prosecution of okay. the conflict. Got it. And is that employee an attorney, a staff member, it the is, DA? It is an assistant DA. Okay. Got it. And, and not a stranger to Mr. Thomas. Not a stranger. They know each other. Mr. Thomas allegedly said X, Y, and Z um, statements that you'd want to use in your prosecution of the case or in this hearing, whenever it is, but that rose to the level where the Fulton DA's office concluded that just it was cleaner and wiser to say, we, we won't be involved with this. That's correct. Judge. Got it. Okay, great. I think you explained that before when we had a status hearing on Mr. Thomas's case. I just couldn't remember when um, uh, my staff was asking, why, why are we having these DeKalb people here? Not that we mind. <laughs> we had a few other cases I could use some help with. Um, there are two motions we're going to work through over the course of today and maybe tomorrow, um, if we need time tomorrow. We have the immunity motion. That's the main one. Uh, but there's also a demur that um, Mr. Thomas's lawyers have filed. I want to talk about that first. Um, there was a third motion to suppress statements that's been withdrawn by the defense if they were statements made to law enforcement, probably still need to do a basic Jackson Deno um, should they need to be used um, at trial by the state. Um, but we'll defer that for now. And I'll take guidance from the state as to whether we'll just do a mini hearing. It may be that there's a stipulation from both sides and I can watch the video of the interview if it's a formal interview. And based on my review of that interim order finding that the nature of the exchange between law enforcement and Mr. Thomas meets all the criteria um, to satisfy Jackson v. Deno. But 
critically, the defense has withdrawn its challenge to the constitutionality of the state obtaining the um, uh, statement from Mr. Thomas. So um, we don't need to work through that today. Uh, Ms. Foster, your demur, uh, and I say your, it could be Ms. Hawkins. I'm happy to hear from either of you and you also can tag team things. Um, but your demur challenges counts four and five of the indictment, which charge Mr. Thomas with possessing a firearm during the commission of a felony. That's a violation of OCGA 1611-106. And I reviewed your motion um, and the indictment, and my read of the charging language is that it um, tracks sufficiently the language of the statute. Um, and so I was wondering if you could help me better understand um, what was imperfect and, and why I ought to grant the motion. Yes, Your Honor. Hey. Um, <laughs> I filed that motion. So um, initially what the challenge was, was that it was a unit of prosecution issue. Um, I have reviewed case law um, and there was case law provided by Mr. Costello. Um, and at this point, I, I think that we don't have to address that um, because the statute or the case does indicate that you can charge per alleged victim. Um, and, I, and that's how it is charged in the indictment. And then um, I think everything else would merge um, once we get to that point. Sure. If we ever get to the and, point of sentencing, yes. um, we could work through merger issues or questions. Um, but I think that would be the remedy. Um, I think that um, the state is entitled to charge that as to each victim, each alleged victim, um, and the way it was charged tracks the language of the statute. So I'm hearing you say that um, you're withdrawing um, the demur. You're not abandoning any argument that there might be merger should there be a sentencing in this case. Is that a fair summary? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. Great. Then where we are is the immunity motion. And in it, um, Mr. Thomas, through counsel, alleges that um, his shooting of Mr. Cooper and inadvertent shooting of Mr. Swain um, was all an instance of self-defense. And uh, he properly invokes the relevant statutes within Title 16 that if uh, I were to um, find that he were um, acting in self-defense and was sufficiently justified, he would be entitled to immunity from criminal prosecution. In other words, um, the case could not proceed. So the highest level of finding in Mr. Thomas's favor would be, we're done. The intermediate finding would be, I don't find that um, you're immune from prosecution, but you certainly would have a self-defense defense at trial um, and we, we would move on. I, I don't think I could prohibit a self-defense defense at trial, even if the evidence were particularly unfavorable to the motion. Um, but that's really what we're working through today and, and if necessary into tomorrow, whether um, I find that the defense has proven by a preponderance that in shooting Mr. Cooper and that it sounds like that bullet, if it was in fact one shot, that's, that's what's set forth in the motion, um, um, somehow went through Mr. Cooper and additionally struck Mr. Swain. It was Mr. Cooper who is allegedly the threat and the basis for Mr. Thomas producing a handgun and firing the handgun, it was defending against the perceived um, use of uh, deadly force or serious bodily injury, whatever might have come from Mr. Cooper. And Mr. Swain was there, again, just taking it from the pleadings and the evidence will be what it is. Mr. Swain was actually trying to keep Mr. Cooper away from Mr. Thomas. Um, he failed and the cost of his failure was that he was shot as well. Um, I'm not making any factual findings by having said what I said. That's actually just me parroting back um, what I read um, in the immunity motion. Um, Ms. Foster, it is your side's burden. So I'm gonna have you call witnesses in a minute. Um, are there any procedural things we need to work through first? No, Your Honor. You have a witness who I think is not available today. So um, we'd be hearing from that person tomorrow. 
He is actually available today, but the state did not object to him appearing via Zoom. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, the, the final back and forth was Mr. Costello, um, uh, after perceiving that maybe we'd be done today, said, let's try to fit it all in today. And so this gentleman will patch in via this Zoom link and will receive his testimony virtually. Correct. And we would just ask to take his testimony out of turn later on this afternoon. Okay, not a problem. Um, the two breaks we have to take today, and we'll break whenever you all might need a break or Ms. Rivers might. Um, I have our exciting monthly bench meeting at 1215. So your lunch break will be my purgatory. Um, and uh, then at 430, we have to stop at 430 because I have another Zoom meeting I need to attend that got crammed at the very end of the day. If we're not done um, by 4.30, um, then we can come back tomorrow. I hope to be taking a plea at 9 o'clock, so I'll have you guys show up at 9.15. Ms. Foster, you need to be here at 9. Um, and, and we'll just pick up with whatever else remains. I've got all morning if we need um, tomorrow as well. So we'll, we'll see where we get with the different witnesses. Um, Mr. Costello, anything procedurally from the state? I don't think so, Judge. Um, I do think that we can hopefully get through this hearing today. Uh, initially, my inclination was to object uh, to a witness appearing via Zoom because this is an evidentiary hearing. Uh, Your Honor did schedule this three months ago, and uh, the state has produced a witness from Texas. Uh, we have law enforcement, an ex-law enforcement officer coming from North Georgia today, and I, I think that, you know, <clears throat> They would have liked to have testified on Zoom. Maybe we could have all worked that out instead of flying these guys in. Uh, but I don't think that we have uh, anything further uh, procedurally, Judge. Okay. Well, we will work through the virtual witness um, uh, in, in whatever manner, Ms. Foster, you sort out with Mr. Costello. Just make sure you all have talked about it. So when he does need to appear, it's not a surprise to anyone. And, and if, if he's got a specific window, I also don't mind because we don't have a jury here. We might be in the middle of a witness and we'll say, let's pause that witness because this individual, I understand one, there's a family tragedy, which of course you couldn't have planned for three months ago. To me, that was compelling. This interview, um, you know what? I got some things I need to do as well, but uh, um, here we all are. So we'll, we'll work through that. And uh, I think in a bench trial, it's not a trial, but a bench hearing setting, um, virtual testimony is manageable. Um, but uh, I understand each side's preference for live in-person testimony. With that, um, why don't you um, call your first witness? Your Honor, at this time, we call Mr. Philip Thomas. All right, Mr. Thomas, if you'll come on up to the stand, please. And, and Your Honor, I'm sorry. I do know who the two gentlemen here are. I don't know who else is in the courtroom. Um, and I know that Folsom County has upgraded its system so much that everything appears outside as well. So I want to make sure that the witnesses that are going to testify for the state are sequestered. Sure. So two things. You're invoking the rule. Um, and um, I will enforce that. Two, the little screen outside is not it's not on. I'm looking. At, I'm looking at the screen as to which are. I mean, that screen is probably on, but it may say like, "Hey, McBurney." Um, it's not a feed of what's going on. So, um, public courtroom, you all are welcome to be in here if you're not testifying. If you plan on testifying, then you need to wait outside. All right, everyone heard that. Everyone can stay. Mr. Thomas, if you come on up, um, Deputy Gordon's going to swear you in. Mr. Thomas, the chair you're sitting in does not have wheels. That's so witnesses don't roll off the witness stand and we have a lawsuit. So it's kind of hard to move, but I need you to move it and you closer to the microphone um, so that we can all hear your important answers to the questions that are asked. Yes, sir. You ready, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, good morning, Mr. Thomas. Good morning. How are you today? I'm okay. Um, so we're going to get some back, some basic background information about you first. Um, how old are you? 53. And um, where are you originally from? Savannah. Savannah. Okay. And how long have you been in the metro Atlanta area? 27, 28 years. And what brought you to Atlanta? I was transferred in the military up at Dobbs Air Force Base, and I went back and also finished college. 
I'm sorry, what was the last part? And I also finished college. And where did you finish college? Morehouse College. Okay, right here in Atlanta. Yes, ma'am. All right. And um, do you have children? Yes, yes, I have four. Girls, boys? Girls. And prior to this, or what do you do for a living? Uh, currently unemployed. And prior to being unemployed, what is it that you do? I was associate athletics director at Morehouse College, um, the number two position in the department. And I was also a professor over at Spelman College. And what did you teach at um, Spelman? At Spelman College, I taught in the uh, education department, uh, educational psychology, uh, intro to special ed, the history of education, education courses, undergrad. And you said you taught at Morehouse as well? No, no, I was just an associate AD there. Okay. Did you teach anywhere else? Yes, Bell Haven University. They out of Jackson, Mississippi. You taught there at the same time you were doing these things, or that was a previous job? No, I taught at the same time um, as an adjunct. It was an evening course. Virtual, or you cruise on down to Jacksonville to teach that? Virtual, sir. Yeah. Uh, and I taught graduate courses there, organizational behavior, um, courses that fall in line under the degree of an MBA or MPA, public administration. And in order to do that, you yourself have a master's too, correct? They have two masters and a PhD. And what is your master's in? One master's from Troy State is in uh, public administration, MPA, and my other master's in education from Georgia State. And what was your, um, I guess, topic or field dissertation in when you were getting your PhD? Um, teacher's perception of inclusion, in the classroom. Um, and you mentioned that you were in the military. What branch of the military were you in? United States Air Force. And how long were you in the military? 20 years. And when did you retire? 2008. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to take you to the incident, uh, the alleged incident date of May 15, 2021. Yes, ma'am. Do you remember May 15, 2021? Yes, ma'am. And what did you do? Um, how, how did your day start on May 15th, 2021? What day? It's not critical, but what, was that a weekend day or a weekday? So week, Saturday? Yes, sir. Okay. So tell, tell me how you started um, your Saturday. Well, that morning, uh, my grandson spent the night with me, so I took him back home. And uh, Mr. Swain, along with uh, Mr. Sylvester, called as a reminder that we was going to meet up with another colleague of ours that uh, in the Shepherd Center. We was gonna have a little lunch with him then, and uh, we was gonna have a family and friends barbecue over at Mr. Swain's house. So around brunch time, mid morning, close to 12, I wanna say, I met up, I drove myself. So it was, and I met up with uh, Thomas Sylvester, Chris Swain, Jamal Carter, and uh, Dare Rice. Okay, and I'm just going to just pause you right yeah. here. When you say Mr. Swain, are you talking about Mr. Christopher Swain? Yes, Christopher Swain. Okay, so you and Mr. Do you and Mr. Christopher Swain have a relationship, or did you all have a relationship prior to May 15, 2021? Yes, we have a relationship. And what did that relationship consist of? Um, he's a fraternity brother of mine. I pledged him. Uh, when you say you pledged him, so that everybody understands, okay. what does that mean? Uh, we all in the same fraternity, and uh, I was the dean of pledges. So when he applied for membership in our initiation program, I was uh, his dean. What fraternity? Omega, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. And uh, so we've been friends since I pledged him, initiated him into our particular chapter of Omega. When did you initiate him into your particular chapter? 2010. So for 10 years, or well, the incident was 2021. So for 11 years, you and Mr. Swain were partners. Yeah, actually, since 2009 that I knew him and he applied for membership in 2010. But yes, but he was like a baby brother to me. Okay. Um, when you say he was a baby brother, you all spent how much time together? <sighs> we were both in the education field and we both was coaching. So couple times a week over the years. Um, at one point, he stayed with me. He didn't have no one to stay. He stayed with me. Um, 
I took care of him like a little brother. You know, he's driven my vehicles, had keys to my house, you know, had clothes in my house, showered at my house, he stayed there from time to time. So he said that you guys were very close. Yeah, he's like my little brother. And mainly in age, I don't mean to say he's a child, but he's like my little brother. Because of the age difference. Yes, 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 ma'am. Okay, understandable. Um, okay, so you, Mr. Swain, um, Jamal Carter, you said Mr. Rice. Yeah, they are Rice and Thomas Sylvester. Thomas Sylvester. Yes. You all go visit another, was it a fraternity brother? Yes, another fraternity brother that was in a bad, nasty car accident, and he's in a wheelchair trying to get himself back together health-wise. He's been in and out of the hospital for a couple of years. <clears throat> and uh, we went to go have lunch with him, cheer him up. You know, boost and this was morale. at the Shepherd Center? Yes, sir. Boost his morale, things of that sort. And we stayed, I don't know, maybe an hour or two. You know, we left and everyone went to uh, Swain's house, Christopher Swain's house. Okay. Um, and why did you all go to Mr. Swain's house? Who was having a family and friends barbecue? And when you say family and friends barbecue, can we, um, is it was it is this a Omega Psi Phi um, function? No, no. Um, I've heard it was, but it was not. It was a family and friends. It was people there that was non Greek as well as Greek. There was a uh, wives, girlfriends, children at this get together. And when you say non Greek, you mean people who are not in a fraternity or sorority? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. It's okay. You just I want everybody to understand what we're talking about. I get it. Yes. I want everybody else to understand. I mean, other people that could have been in fraternities or sororities, but the event itself wasn't an Omega event or Omega and the Delta women can come or something like that. It was, no. these are friends. And it may be that we have a Greek tradition that we share, but it was friends of you and Mr. Swain and uh, these other people. Yes. Uh, Swain, I believe he knows just about everybody was there. It was his. His house. Yeah. His okay. Together. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, so roughly around roughly what time did this friends and family barbecue take place? It had already started, from my understanding, before we got there. So I'm assuming when we got there, the place was pretty packed. And I want to say we got there around 1 p.m. or so. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, so people were already there when we arrived. And did you, I know you said you drove yourself, mm -hmm. but did you, Mr. Swain, and the other gentleman, make it back to Mr. Swain's house at the same time? Within, I, I want to say within that same probably 30 minute window, I believe someone might have made a stop or whatever, but I went straight there. Where, where in uh, Fulton County is Mr. Swain's house? Off, off Bankhead. Off and, Bankhead? Yes, sir. Going toward uh, 285. Okay. And for geographical reference, um, what is located near Mr. Swain's house? There's a, a, a school across the street in, a, I believe, in a Fulton County Library. Okay. Also, sorry. what school is across the street? I don't know the name of it. Okay. Um, okay, so you get to Mr. Swain's house. There's already people um, present at Mr. Swain's house. There's this barbecue that has to be done. What do you do when you get to Mr. Swain's house? Greeted uh, some people that I knew there and uh, chopped it up, talked. Uh, I was out on the, the driveway area just talking, saw some people I haven't seen in a while, just chopping it up, talking. The term you're using is chopping it up? Yeah, I'm sorry, talking. No, chopping is fine. Um, I just wanted to know what words you were using. Yeah, talking. May use that someday. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so you're having conversation with people at the barbecue. Do you know everyone who's there? No. Um, okay, so you're talking to people that you do know. Yes, ma'am. Because this is roughly a year or so after the pandemic started, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so this is, was this the first barbecue or first real major get together following the, the shutdown that COVID did to us? Yes, ma'am. Um, so at what point, or was there ever a point where you came into contact with a Mr. Kendrick Cooper? Yes, ma'am. Um, a little while after I got there, I'm not exact sure of the time, but a little while after I got there, he made a comment in the middle 
of the, the driveway area where everybody had lawn chairs, a couple of picnic tables that uh, he was in town for something. I'm not sure what he was in town for, but he needed to see all of the uh, 2021 line line up and get good with him. Okay. Okay. I was going to, I was going to explain to you honestly. Yes. I mean, we're going to break that down. Yes, ma'am. Before we break it down, I, I think I know what a line is, but I'm going to want you to make it clear in the record. Yes, um, uh, did you know Mr. Cooper or was this a stranger to you? There's just this guy who says I'm in town and I want the 2021s to line up and do their thing. Yeah. He was a stranger to me. I never met him in my life. This was the first time you'd encountered him. Yes, John. Okay. So your first encounter with Mr. Cooper, he's from out of town. So he's an out of town brook. Um, and he's coming to this cookout um, where there are other bros because you all refer to yourselves as bros, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So there's another bro there. I mean, so he's there with the, the other bros that are there. And he says, I need to see all of 2021 line up. Yes. So, did you all just bring out a new line of pledges um, on May 15th? So this is despite it being non-Greek, this guy is saying, I want to see the 20, I assume he's talking about Omega's lining up. Yes. Um, and so, and did you, so in, in response to um, Ms. Hawkins's question, were there a bunch of brand new pledges there? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And just to clarify the record, Mr. Cooper is not non-Greek. He is a member. Yes, of he's Omega a member, Sci-Fi. not my particular chapter, but he is a member of Omega Sci Fi Fraternity. Okay. I figured since he wanted the 21s to line up. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So when, um, and then you, I, I believe I also heard you say they needed to line up to get good with me. Yes. And what do, what does get good with me mean in your, from your position? When I've, well, I don't know how other, fraternities or sororities uh, organizations do, but within our fraternity, getting good means a person wants to see what you know. It's uh, in a historic format about the fraternity itself. And depending on honestly what region of the U.S. you're from, uh, what HBC you might have went through or district, they want to question you two, three questions, and sometimes it gets out of hand, but they want a person wants to question you. Would you consider that a challenge? Yes, it's, it's definitely a, a challenge. A challenge like we're fighting or a challenge is in, I, I want you guys to impress me. More so impress upon the person asking, but it's, it's real easy for to escalate into something. Judge, I'm going to object to speculation. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to understand. I'm not asking him to speculate what happened there, but in your experience with someone calling out new pledges to line up and pledge may be the wrong term. It may be admittees, but the new folks um, to line up, um, has that always been a peaceful event or not? And if not, from your experience, not reading in books, but being there, why would it not be peaceful? Is I've seen it go both ways, but mostly non-peaceful because in my experience and in my eyes of what I've seen, we're talking about adults and no one wants a manhood challenge like that. And sometimes people take offense to that and that can get out of hand real quick. So it becomes words and then words can escalate, but it's not part of a tradition that telling people to line up and get good means someone's going to get punched in the face or paddled or something like that. Correct. Okay. Okay. So Mr. Cooper says everybody needs to line up or 2021 needs to line up and get good with me. What happens next? I was asking, I was like, who is this guy right here? Because like I say, it was a family and friends cookout. And you had people with their children there. And I was standing to one of my, standing next to one of my fraternity brothers. He had his two-year-old daughter right there. I'm like, what is this guy? This is not what we do. This ain't the time or the place. Okay. And what did you do after you inquired who this guy was? Can I, can I, can I ask her a question or no? Nope. Okay. 
No, it flows the other way. Okay, yeah. Um, if you don't understand the question, you can say, I don't understand the question. No, no. I, I will say for the record, Your Honor, Mr. Thomas keeps looking at the door, and I think because people are entering out and coming and going, um, there may be someone who shouldn't be in the courtroom that may have entered the courtroom. Okay, well, Deputy Gordon does a good job of saying, hey, are you here to testify? And if they're here to testify, he has them um, leave. So um, I'm going to assume he continues his filtering role. And you stay focused, Mr. Thomas, on the questions. And don't worry about what's going on in the background. Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Sure. Um, so I think my last question was, what, what happens or what do you do after you've inquired who this guy is? I walked up to him and I said, uh, bro, I said, I don't, I don't know you, but this ain't what we do. And I say, but if it'll calm you down, I'll be your 21. Okay. And when you say this ain't what we do, what did you mean by that? You're not about to haze up these new initiates in front of everybody like this. It can get out of hand. And the initiates had just crossed not even, well, approximately 30 days ago, ago from that day. It was, it was an April line of 2021. Okay. Um, so... You approach Mr. Cooper and you're, 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 you're telling him that, hey, this isn't what we do. This is a family function. Um, what happens next? Well, he assumed when I say, I say, I'll be your 21. He assumed I was 21, 2021, the year. And uh, he walked me like in a chummy way. He walked me from the middle of the patio area to like the end of the house where the barbecue grill was in the DJ booth, little DJ was set up. And uh, he asked, I can't remember exactly. I'm gonna stop you right there. Yes, ma'am. One, how he walked you. How did he walk you? What, what did he ask? Did you walk on your own? How did he walk you? Sure, you can, you can use um, Ms. Hawkins as um, you, and you are Mr. Um, Cooper, whatever helps you illustrate it. Okay. And he's saying, I'll be your 21. Is that a calm you down? He gave a little smirk on his face and he kind of put me in like a headlock to walk over like about to ask me some questions. And we walked maybe six to eight feet over. And that's when the, the barbecue grill and the DJ was set up in the back of the house, like in on the grassy area. Okay. How tall are you? Um, I'm 5'10", Your Honor. Okay. And Mr. Cooper, was he taller than you, shorter than you? What's your recollection? Uh, my recollection is he's taller. As in he towered over you or he would have been a little bit taller? You said he put you in a headlock. Um, that makes it sound like maybe he's 6'6", six, six, so he could oh, get his arm around your neck like that. I, I want to say maybe six foot. He, he was a little taller. Not okay. Taller. That makes sense. Yes, ma'am. He was taller than you. But yes. When he I kind of leaned down, you know, just to get him out of the, in the middle, you know, I followed along for a quick second to see what he was going to say. And then uh, we got where we got near the barbecue grill. I can't, I'm, I'm sorry, I know you said get close. Near the barbecue grill in the DJ booth. And uh, he asked me a question about the turn. I'm not sure what it was, but I just remember cutting him off. I said, to be honest, I'm not 2021. I'm 2002. I was the charter line this chapter and when you say the charter line of this chapter one what chapter are you talking about i'm a member of a within the fraternity phi kappa kappa chapter that's a, a historic military based chapter we are at fort mcpherson fort gillen but the bases have closed but we are still chartered out of east point okay. and when you say you are the charter line what does that mean in the history of the chapter there is of all the lines, my line was the first line to, to uh, be initiated through that founding of that chapter. So you are the, you, you are the founder of that chapter? Yes, one of the founding members, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so you tell Mr. Cooper, hey, I'm not 2021. I'm actually the founding member of PKK. What happens then? He got upset, um, started fussing, I think I blew him off at first, but he was getting really loud, this and that, and uh, I don't, okay, he was just getting loud, um, excuse my French, he was like, you fuck nigga, you this, that, 
uh, motherfucker, that's bullshit. Again, excuse my French. Hey, if you're repeating what was said, that's what you need to do. And uh, people that were standing around kind of saw what was going on. So they kind of brushed it off and we separated. I w- we went on our separate ways. I was just looking at him sideways um, from that point. So during this argument, um, or this, I won't say argument, but um, were you responding back to Mr. Cooper? No. Um, so as he's yelling explicit, was, was he in your face? No, that when he started the yelling part, that's when I started removing myself. And then people came walking around to get between us. And uh, I went back uh, toward the lawn chair that I was sitting in. Okay. And at, during that interaction with Mr. Cooper, was there ever a point where things got physical? Not at that point, no. Okay. So Mr. Cooper is upset. He's all right. I rate he's yelling explicit. You remove yourself from the situation. You go back to your lawn chair. What happens after that? Dale Rice was sitting in the lawn chair next to me. We were just chopping it up, talking. We were just talking back and forth, and a scuffle broke out. They said it was a fight in the house. I'm like, who's fighting? And uh, come to find out that was uh, Mr. Cooper and uh, Bruce Richardson, another chapter brother of mine, fought inside the house. And some people broke it up. He came back out. Um, then the DJ came to me. A little while after that, the DJ asked me, he was like, hey, Phil, because evidently Mr. Cooper still had, uh, he was still upset that he felt I fooled him or whatever by saying I was 21. So it was a lot of pockets of information to go around and people just uh, getting into it with him and questioning me, like what's going on? I didn't know what was going on because I don't know him. So the DJ asked me, he said, Phil, um, the DJ name is, uh, we call him DJ Bone. DJ so, what? Bone, B-O. Bone. Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. So he was like, Phil, hey, Coop upset about earlier. He said like that, Coop upset about earlier. Do you mind talking to him? Y'all can squash this because if you calm down, then everybody else gonna calm down. And I remember telling um, the DJ, I said, listen, first and foremost, this is not a gang. I'm not going to talk to him. I'm a grandfather. I don't get out much. I'm not finna talk to another adult about behavior. And he said, Phil, every time PKK has events, y'all always been good to me. You hire me to work to events. Do it for me. Coop's a good guy. You're a good guy. Personalities. And I, I didn't want to. I said, okay, I'll talk to him. So the DJ walked me back over where he was and Coop happened to be there. Um, and that's when I left from sitting with D Rice and uh, D-, D Rice had just fixed me a drink. So I take my, I had a uh, plastic cup in my hand and I walk over with the DJ. Coop's there and I'm thinking, according to the DJ, Coop's wants to talk and he wants us to talk to squash any perceived beef so everybody will calm down. And I'm like, first of all, I have one grandchild, not all these folk in here. I can't control what other people do or who he get into it with. So we go in that little area by the DJ booth and the grill, like I said earlier. Uh, Mr. Cooper is already standing there. It's, you know, it's a bunch of people around, but he's already standing there. And before we can even get to a conversation, I say, what's on your mind, good brother? And that's how I greet everybody. It's a term of endearment. What's on your mind, good brother? So he goes off, start cursing me out. Motherfucker, you lied to me. You know, I don't know who niggas think they are. I kill a nigga with my bare hands. And that was a comment he made. I didn't thre- to your say, Judge, on that. <clears throat> but I heard him say it. Oh, I'm sorry. Stop. I'm sorry. Your Honor, um, I would say that it's not your say because it is the effect on the listener. And I have a case to cite for you. You don't need to cite a case. Um, so I'm going to allow it. Um, I assume we're going to hear from Mr. Cooper. That doesn't make it not hearsay. Um, but I, I, don't well we'll see how this progresses um i understand the context of self-defense and whatnot i think it is the effect on the listener as opposed to you're offering it for the truth of the matter asserted that mr cooper routinely kills people with his bare hands so i'm with that understanding i'll allow it in okay but like i said he was getting really angry and loud and uh at that point 
I told the DJ, I said, I'm done. I said, I did you a favor. I tried, but I'm done. I wasn't going to go back and forth with him. And I looked at him. I said, you know what? I don't really know you, but I'm going to show you something called deference. And I had the cup in my hand. And I said, what are you drinking? I said, brother, just fix me a drink. I'm going to fix you a drink. What are you drinking? He steps back and look at me. And he swings at me. And I had the cup because I was showing him. I said, what would you like to drink? And he punches me through the cup. So him and his, him, his fist, well, his fist and his cup slapped me in the face. So it was a drink that just was made. So it got all over me. He rushed me and grabbed me. And then people grabbed everybody and they're pulling, pulling us apart after he punched me. He pulled us apart. Um, I don't know where he went at that point. I dried off. I had a towel in my truck. I dried off and uh, went back to Dara Rice where the lawn chair was. Then I made a phone call. I was like, who is that dude? Before we go further, are you saying that Mr. Cooper in swinging at you caused your drink to hit you or in the hand, in his hand, as he swung at you, he had his own drink. No. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. You tell me which one it was. My drink. He punched my drink in my face. Got he it. swung at me, but my hand was in front of my face. So Got it. So his hand hit your hand and your drink, drink and everything hit you. No, his hand hit my cup in my face. Yeah. In my drink. Yeah. Okay. So it's not, so two things hit your face, your cup and his hand, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So when wheels pulled apart, um, I dried off. Like I said, I had a towel in my uh, truck. I had on a t-shirt, some sweatpants. And I was like, uh, Daryl asked me, was I okay? I said, yeah, man. But this, you know, I was real perturbed about that. So I remember saying bye to my brother, Ricky, him and his daughter was, was leaving. His little Tuyo that I was also sitting was, they left. And I said, you know, I say, who is this guy? And someone said, they called out the word Coop, like short for Cooper. I said, what chapter is he in? He said he from out of town. Where did he pledge? And someone said he pledged in the Douglasville chapter. And it's, it's called uh, Tri-Mu, Tri-Mu chapter. T-R-I space M-U. Excuse me. Tri-Mu is Mu, 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 yes. There's three Mu's. In Greek letter, M-U, 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 I'm sorry. So at that point, I said, wait a minute, I have a colleague from college that's in that chapter. So I pull my phone out and I call my colleague. His name is DeAndre Royals. We went to college together, played ball together at Morehouse College. So um, he answered. I said, Dre, what's going on? How you doing, brother? He said, man, I'm good, man. How you doing? It's been a minute, you know. Uh, small talk. So I said, Hey man, I'm at a family friend's barbecue at one of my Neil's house. Mr. Swain is my Neil. And I say, I just got into it with this guy. They say he from Tramu. DeAndre says back to me. He said, what's his name? So I said, Hey, what's his, what's that guy named again? Like that. And, uh, they say, they call him Coop. I said, Dre, they call him Coop. He said, yeah, yeah. That's my live five. I said, okay, well, he's living it up around here. And we, I don't know how long we was on the phone together, um, but we, we uh, chopped it up for a minute, talked more so for a minute. And uh, did you say live five? Yes. That's what Mr. Royal said? Yes. Okay. And what did you understand live five to mean? Um, He's all the way live. He's a firecracker. Okay. And um, live five, five refers to his position in his yeah. line, correct? Yes. It, Meaning he's the fifth in the line. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes Sean. So I say. Are all the fives live five, or he was explaining that this no, guy. Was, no, DeAndre told me he, he just a live five. There could be a dull five and a flat five and a boring five, but the, or that's just what they refer to, like, there's um, life, it just happens to rhyme, or is that just how you refer to the fifth? No, um, he's considered a live five. He's supposed to be a little firecracker, according to DeAndre Royals. Okay. So, but the line's not by height? 
I mean, they line people up by firecracker rating? No, they line people. Traditionally, they line, you're lined up by your height. Okay. Some chapters do it differently, but traditionally, you're lined up by your height. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. I'm, I'm sorry. What was that? It's okay. It's okay. okay. Um, so the live five, you guys, you and Mr. Royals are chopping it up. And at some point, you all get off the clock. Yes. And what do you do once you've now, I guess, gotten more information about who Mr. Cooper is? I sat back down in my lawn chair with, uh, with uh, Daryl Rice. And uh, Daryl got ready to leave. When uh, the incident happened, him punching a drink in my face. I guess it was around three o'clock. It was hot. I remember it was hot. It was around three o'clock. And uh, I just carried on with the evening until everyone starts to leave. I'm, I'm guessing around 10, 10, 10, 30 people starting to leave. And I remember. I'm sorry. I don't know what you're yes, ma'am. So between three o'clock and 10 o'clock, you're doing what? Chopping so it up. Yes, chopping up, socializing, Your Honor. Okay. Socializing. No other interactions with Mr. Cooper. No, um, I don't recall talking to him no more. But it was said no, that okay. Him. I don't remember talking to him no more that evening. Um, now around eleven or so, people are starting to leave. I'm about to leave at this point, and uh, me and Jamal was walking to my truck. So I get my Jamal my car. Okay. So I have my cell phone charger in the back of the cargo area of the truck. Uh, my wallet had on sweatpants and uh, had my weapon in the back of the truck in the towel that I dried off with. Okay. So I got, I'm sorry. yes, ma'am. Uh, Jamal Carter is another of my Neos. Him and Mr. Swain were line brothers. I pledged both of them together. They was line brothers. On the same line. We placed on the same line. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you're in the back of your truck gathering your belongings. Yes. Jamal. Jamal came to the side of the truck and he was like, Swain was at my truck. He was. Where? Y'all, am I stand up again? Please. What kind of truck are we talking about? Um, it's a Mercedes GL 450. And where is your truck parked in uh, relation to where the parking is? Okay, if that desk, if that desk right there was the driveway up into the patio, the back of the house, this is a street, and my truck was parked here on the street. So I gather my things, and I go to the front of my truck. Swing's talking to me. Carter asks Swing, would he, would he like for me and him to help take out the trash? Swing tells Jamal Carter, he said, no, I'm good, guys. Appreciate the brothers. I'm talking to Swing. He was like, hey man, let's go home. I talked to the group. Y'all two, he said the same thing he just said. He said, y'all two good brothers, you know, um, personality, conflict, whatever he was saying. And I was like, hey man, I'm good. I'm good. So Jamal Carter says, hey, Cooper got into it with somebody else. I'm not thinking about it because there's no one around us. So Coops, Mr. Cooper, was running down the street toward my truck. So it gets to the front of my truck on the driver's side door. I just cracked the door. I'm here. Mr. Swain, maybe a foot away from me, we talk. He's like, hey, this foot on the curb. And I'm on the, my truck is parked on the curb. We just chop it up talking. So Jamal Carter comes around. He's like, go, I think he's like, go get my plate. I'll be right back. He never went to go get the plate. He was coming around the truck. And Swing was like, nah, I appreciate it, brothers. Y'all good, let's go home. Cooper is running down the street toward my truck. Okay, I'm gonna stop you so we can slow this part out. Okay. Um, when you say he's running down the street, because your car is parked, is it parallel to the house? Is it perpendicular? How is it? It's parallel to the house. Okay. So, and is it facing towards the house or away from the house? It's on the side of the house. Um, if that's the house, the front door is at this, it's a corner house, first of all, it's a corner house. Right. The front door is pointing at the street. Right. And it's the corner house of, we own the street. There's another street here. The front door of the house is there. So the house is long this way. And the street, then my car, the 
is mine dated also. So the house is here, the street in my car. I can stand in my car and see the kitchen. That makes sense. Okay, so and from the stop sign, he's running from the stop sign. So maybe 200 feet or so from the stop sign to where my truck is parked toward the back of the house. Okay, and at this point, where is Mr. Swain standing as it relates to you? As yes. Cooper is running. Swain, if I'm here, let's say my truck's here at the front of you. Can here, and I'll be swaying. Okay, so I'll be ready to go. Ready? Okay. You, you, he's in my personal space and we just he's talking. And Mr. Carter is coming around your truck towards you? Yes. So Mr. Carter is on this side of the truck and he asked about the trash. And he saw Cooper running down the street. He just came in to us and he was like, they go cool, you get into it somebody else. But he was actually coming toward me. And when he came toward me, I'm still standing here with Mr. Swain, Chris Swain. So Mr. Swain's back is to Mr. Cooper. Yes, and then he turned when Jamal made the comment. Swain turns. Okay. So he sees Mr. Cooper coming at me. He's coming at me. Yeah, like, go ahead. Go, you back. Go ahead. So he had one hand behind his back. He had one hand pointing at me. He said, motherfucker, I kill you. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Swain down. Um, you're saying it louder now. Okay. So he's running. How fast is he running? About. Little job uh, he's sprinting with a hand behind his back. Not a sprint, but it's not a job. So I don't know the, the vernacular to say a, a, a percentage of speed is it's not a full on. He's not running a forty yard dash, I would say, but it's dark, so and I can see his hands. He pointed one hand in the air, so he gets now. There's and I can't say honestly if it was a male or female. If it was a shadow behind him. Running behind him. Swain was here. So when Swain sees him, he said, Man, this getting caught. When Swain sees him, Swain turns around. And Swain jumped, not in this hand. I had my <clears throat> cell phone, my laptop. I had a long laptop charger that plugs in the car with her, like a house plug, so it charges faster. I had that in his hand, and my key on the key ring, and I had my weapon in his hand. And I said, man, don't come in my personal space like that. And he said, he's going to appeal me and the motherfucker is. Swain attempts to grab him. Can you come close to him? So I can show you. I'm, this is my front of my truck. Swain turns. He's right here. So he's a barrier between Mr. Cooper running up on me. My truck is here and Swain's here. Swain, he lunges at me. Swain, as he, I'm sorry. Who is he? Is this a lot of heat? Mr. Cooper lunged at me. Okay. Swain tries to grab Mr. Cooper. Can I grab him? Mm -hmm. He tried to grab Mr. Cooper and he slips and falls on the ground when he was lunging at me. And I shot Cooper. And I stepped back like this. My, my hand was waistline with my phone in this hand. My hand was waistline. And Swain fell on the ground. And Cooper went down. Now, I'm not another expert, nothing like that, but the bullet evidently went through Cooper's side, ricocheted off the ground, and hit Swain in the leg. At that point, whoever was running behind him, I remember this, at this point, I remember a black female and a black male. There were some screams, they picked Cooper up, he got up, and they disappeared. Jamal said, Swain's been hit. I hit Swain moment. So I, Get on the ground and swing and check on him. Um, I was pat I remember patting his body, I didn't see anything. I was like, oh no, shit. So I, I uh, saw the blood on the ground now. I said, it's blood. So I saw he was hitting the leg. And I yelled at Jamal. I said, call 911. The other people I, I heard in the background, call the ambulance, call the ambulance. I don't know how much time he lacks, but so much in my mind, it was taking too long. Another returning brother of ours was there, Johnny Green. I said, Johnny, pop the back of my truck. I'm taking Swain to the hospital. So Johnny pops the back of my truck. I said, Jamal, help me. So Jamal was laying the seats down, and Johnny came around my truck, and we picked Swain up. I remember wrapping his leg with that towel that I wiped off with him, and I wrapped his leg. Jamal jumped in the back with him to hold me. And, uh, I jumped in my truck and made a beeline to a... Uh, 
Grady Hospital. Okay, I'm gonna stop you right there. Yes. Um, from from Bankhead to Grady Hospital. Yes, sir. Um, so I want to go back to the moment where Mr. Cooper is running towards you and then when he lunges at you. So when he's running towards you, um, yelling, you say, motherfucker, I killed you. Yes. How are you feeling? That he meant what he said. And that's based on what I heard and saw him say earlier throughout the day. Um, <clears throat> were you afraid? Yes. Were you fearful? Yes. Were you believing that he would cause harm to you? Yes. And when he lunged at you, how did that make you feel? Like either me or him, I don't know what he has. And I, I did not know what he had in his hand because I couldn't see his hand. And for the fact that I couldn't see his hand, it was behind his back. And the statements he made to me, that motherfucker, I'll kill you. I felt that's what he, his plan was. And again, that's my feeling because I don't know this gentleman from a bucket of paint. Never met him in my life. I don't know if he's playing or not playing because I don't play like that. And I don't know this person to assume nothing. Do you recall anyone trying to, other than Swain, trying to stop him from getting to you? Um, I don't know exactly what the person <clears throat> that was chasing him trying to do, but it was definitely a person chasing him. Um, and you indicated that you had your gun in your hand at like, like this waistline, correct? Yeah, my left hand. In your left hand? Yes. Um, and you're able to shoot with your left hand? Yes, ma'am. Um, is that a part of your training as a milita uh, former military guy? Yes, I'm, I can shoot left or right. And one of my, that was one of my first jobs in the military. What was one of your first jobs? I was a combat arms trainer. Um, it was my job to train the, the fellow soldiers, pilots, um, security police. Okay. And so waistline, you fire your gun at waistline. You, if waist length would be what, his stomach area? Mm -hmm. you did, did you aim for his chest? No. Did you aim for his head? No. Did you aim or did you just, he's right there. And so using your left hand, which is not your dominant hand, you pulled the trigger. Yes, sir. Okay. So it wasn't that you were, hey, I see a belt buckle. I'm going to try to hit that. And it just, you're shooting at this guy of whom you're afraid. Yes. Yes, Your Honor. And how many shots do you fire? Once. And what happens when that one shot is fired? What happens to Cooper? I'm sorry. He he falls back. Okay. He falls back on the ground and right next to Swain, Mr. Swain, that was already on the ground. Okay, he slipped. And that's when I saw a male and a female pick Cooper up and they walked away. They walked into the, the dark and I was still back in my truck with Swain. So when Cooper fell back, he was no longer charging at you. No. Right? Um, you can continue to tell us what happened once you got to the room. When I got, we got Swain in my truck, Jamal Carter rode with me, and got to Grady, but on the way to Grady, I called my attorney. And I was like, Denaris, listen. Who's your attorney? Meaning at that time, who was it that you called? Denaris Heard. And why exactly did you have an attorney? Well, he's my attorney, but he's also my line brother. Ah, okay. He's also my line brother, but he's my attorney. He's helped me out with uh, legal issues in the past as far as like child support. But, and, uh, and line brother here would mean he's part of the 
founding chapter, founding line, charter, charter line, charter line yes. of your chapter. Yes. Not that he was on a line of your chapter at some point, but line brother would mean he's part of the charter line. We play us together. Okay. Yeah. I was a four, he was a two. So he's really short. Yes. Okay. Short. <laughs> okay, so you get to Grady. Yes. And then what happens? Well, he met me at Grady. I pull up in the emergency bay area with ambulance pull up. I pull up with my hazard lights on. I uh, I asked Jamal Carter to go see about getting the physician and some nurses in the gurney. And I ran to the back to check on Swain while he was doing that, saw him coming. And I was trying to flag an officer down. So at the time I was looking for an officer in the dock, one came out the double doors and said, excuse me, sir, you can't park here. I said, sir, I need to talk to you and some officers. The guy that went in, he said, well, you can park and go see him. I said, no, he was, it was a shooting that I'm a part of and I need to talk to someone. So the cop looked at, the police officer looked at me, he came over to uh, speak to me. My truck was still running and everything. And at the time he walked to me, my attorney was walking over at the same time. He had just parked across the street and he was walking over. So I'm standing with my attorney and the, the police officer and then three more police officers came over. I think it, it, throughout the conversation, total maybe six. So they came and um, one of the gentlemen sidebar with my attorney heard for a few seconds and he came back to me and he started asking me questions. And he meaning your lawyer, the police officer, the police officer started asking me questions. My, my attorney turned to me. He said, you can talk. Okay. And I told them what I just said just now. And, um, they told me they asked for permission to search my vehicle. I said, yes, you have my permission. And, uh, he went and got, he said, where's the gun? I said, the gun is right there. And I pointed at it. I'm about six feet away from my truck. Like I said, the truck was still running. The uh, door, my door was still open. I just pointed at it. He went and retrieved the, the gun and he went into the back. I think I had some slippers or something, some shower shoes. I don't know. But uh, he, the other people, officers came, took pictures and stuff like that. And. Okay. Um, so you initiated contact with the police. Yes, ma'am. Um, you also drove Mr. Swain to the hospital. Yes, ma'am. Um, you didn't flee. No. Um, and you indicated to officers that you were involved in a shooting. Yes, ma'am. And that you needed help. Yes, ma'am. Where you're from. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Swain. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Nothing further this time. Um, it may be that Mr. Costello or Ms. Jackson have questions for you, but I've got a couple more, um, Mr. Thomas. So as I'm recreating it in my head, you are standing next to the driver door of what you call your truck, um, your Mercedes, and um, Mr. Cooper is running towards you, um, not sprinting full out, somehow running in a way where one hand is behind his back. So you, one hand is, is pointing up or pointing towards you, and the other hand is, is mystery. Um, he gets close enough that Mr. Swain is able to engage with him unsuccessfully because Mr. Swain slips sort of down to the ground, and you described a lunge. Was the lunge what Mr. Swain was intercepting, or was the lunge something that happened after – Mr. Swain tried to stop Mr. Cooper and slid to the ground. I'm not even sure it happened so fast. I remember the lunge and it was like when Swain, Mr. Swain tried to stand between us and grab him. Got it. So it was sort of all at the same time. Yes, sir. When I think of a lunge, I think of right. um, body and hands coming towards you. Um, but you've described to me not knowing what's in Mr. Cooper's hands. Um, when he lunged, did he somehow lunge with one hand and like this? He was pointing at me, still cussing. Okay, so he's lunging at you, about to make contact, and keeping he, one hand behind his back. And Mr. Swain try to hug, like I did to a Attorney Hawkins, try to grab him. Okay, so he can secure both arms, like yep. a bear hug type thing. Yep, he tried to grab him. And doing that process, that's when he slipped to the ground. Okay. And so Mr. Swain is going to the ground. Um, what effect did Mr. Swain's attempt to bear hug 
uh, stop Mr. Cooper have on Mr. Cooper? Did it stop him? Did it cause Mr. Cooper's hidden hand to appear? What, what happened as Swain slid down Mr. Cooper? Nothing because he slid down. So it didn't stop no progress, and no forward motion or standstill or knock him down to the ground. Also, he just, he just slipped like, uh, you grab an air and nothing's there. Okay. When we see ineffective tacklers do that in football games all the time. He, he did a bad job tackling. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, have um, Ms. Hawkins come as close to you as she should if she is Mr. Cooper at the time you shot Mr. Cooper. Is she too far away? So you, you need to stand in wherever you are. So you, you are where you are. Okay. Don't move from there. And then have Ms. Right okay. That close. Yes. Okay, and um, hold your arm out. And Mr. Costello, if you need to see what he's doing, you're welcome to stand up. No, no, don't move. You're, you're, Cooper doesn't move. In fact, Cooper falls down. I'm not going to make you fall down. So Ms. Hawkins is standing as close to you right now as you recall Mr. Cooper being when you shot him. Yes, sir. Okay, and your gun was in your left hand. Yes, sir. Um, and you're sort of um, recreating a gun with your fingers. Um, where should Ms. Hawkins put her hands so they are where Mr. Cooper's hands were, um, because you've talked about not knowing what was in his hands. This, this hand was here. This hand, at that point, but I can see him corner my, my face. Okay. All right. And then your gun was up on the left side, and you shoot once. Yes. And Mr. Swain is somehow between the two of you on the ground? When Swain slipped, I remember him slipping. I remember he was standing here when I was here. Yeah. He was chest to chest talking, mm -hmm. and he turned he slipped. He just fell right here. Got it. So he's alongside Mr. Cooper. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. And then when you shot Mr. Cooper, he initially fell to the ground. Yes, sir. But he fell backwards and not forwards? No, he did not fall forwards. He just like, dropped. Okay. So he was alongside um, uh, Mr. Swain. Yes. All right. And then he got whisked away by these unknown people. Um, and then you tended to Mr. Swain. Okay, you guys can separate now. All right, thank you. That's helpful. Mr. Costello? Thank you, Judge. Oh, yeah. I took over. Uh, good morning, Mr. Thomas. Good morning, sir. My name is Michael Costello. I'm one of the prosecutors that's assigned to this case. I have a couple of questions for you. If at any time I ask a question that's unclear or it's confusing, uh, just let me know and I'll rephrase it for you. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to start out with a couple of, uh, I think, some points of agreement. Uh, you were at a party on May 15th, 2021. Yes, sir. And that party was at 688 South Elizabeth Place. Yeah, that sounds like the address. And uh, that's the address of Christopher Swain's home. Yes, sir. And you drove your car to this party? Yes, sir. And you brought a handgun with you? Yes, sir. And you were at this party for several hours? Yes, sir. And there was alcohol at this party? Yes, sir. And you drank alcohol at this party? Yes, sir. Uh, and it's not in dispute that you fired your gun at this party. Oh, yes, sir. And you fired it towards Kendrick Cooper. Yes, sir. And Christopher Swain was near Kendrick Cooper when you fired. He was near me when, Chris, when Mr. Cooper came toward me. Swain was near me. Uh, I'll rephrase it. Um, when you yes, fired the round, Christopher Swain was near Kendra Cooper. Yes, sir. And we're in agreement you fired one shot. Yes, sir. And that one struck, that one shot struck Mr. Cooper. Yes, sir. And also struck Mr. Swain. Yes, sir. And you would also agree that a handgun is a firearm. Yes, sir. And a firearm is a deadly weapon? Yes, sir. And that shooting a firearm at someone uh, could lead them to receive an injury? Yes, sir. A violent injury? Yes, sir. 
and firing a handgun at someone is considered deadly force. Objection. It's a, oh, yes, he's asking uh, Mr. Or Mr. Thomas to make a legal conclusion. Okay, um, you may wanna ask it. I, I, you should probably ask it in a different way. Um, I, I think as a matter of law, um, I need to find that a firearm is a deadly weapon and thus it is capable of inflicting deadly force on someone. So um, let's keep um, Mr. Thomas in the um, fact witness role as opposed to legal conclusion role. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Thomas, I'll transition a little bit uh, into what happened at the party now. Uh, so at this party, you were a guest of Christopher Swain's? Yes, sir. And you had never met Kendra Cooper before? No. And you never had any prior confrontations with Mr. Cooper before May 15th, 2021. That's correct. Uh, but there was a confrontation between you and Mr. Cooper at this party. Yes, sir. And it was over fraternity rules? No, sir. Um, I believe you testified on direct that uh, he was, uh, you know, engaging members of the fraternity and that may not be Maybe I'm paraphrasing it incorrectly, but it wasn't in accordance with what should have been going on. No, he was he was out of line to I felt he was out of line to make these guys, quote unquote, line up to get good with him. So it wasn't a fraternity thing, per se, because our confrontation never got to that, because when I told him who I was, what my year was, it went totally left. So it never got to no fraternity questioning or nothing like that. No. And in um, Mr. Cooper engaging these other individuals that were fraternity brothers, uh, he didn't fight any of those individuals. In the, in he, he didn't fight any of those uh, individuals. The 2021 line? Yes. He didn't fight any of those individuals. I don't know that he did or not. I, I do know he was in a scuffle with another member of our particular chapter, a fight, mm -hmm. but I don't know what other scuffles he might have been into that night. He got into it with a couple of people, but, but I don't when, know. When, when Mr. Cooper um, directed the 21s to line up and make it good, whatever the phrase was, um, you shared with me, you were a little concerned about that because in your experience, having people line up and make it good can get kind of rough. Yes. Um, did it get rough or did it never happen? In other words, the 21s never in fact they lined at up. that particular time, Your Honor? No, they did not line up. Okay. Uh, and Kendrick Cooper didn't pull out any weapons on any of these 21s? Not that I know of. And uh, I guess we'll call this the first encounter. Um, you testified on direct that Mr. Cooper had you in some sort of headlock. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could breathe? Yes. You could swallow? Yes. Did, did you feel any kind of pressure on your neck? No. So a headlock was a way, as I took it, to describe, he put his arm around you and um, it may have been kind of fake friendly, but it was, hey, we're gonna walk over here and talk. Yes, John, exactly. It wasn't a, and he's rubbing your forehead and um, poking your eyes or anything no, like sir. that. No, sir. Okay. And you weren't injured during this headlock? No, sir. And um, he said that Mr. Cooper got loud. He was using uh, explicit language, but you also said he was not in your face. When the first encounter? This is the first encounter, yes. No, we were not chest to chest. Yeah. We so were... this is an argument. Yes. And during this argument, you never saw Mr. Cooper with any weapons? No, sir. And it never turned physical? This first encounter never no, turned sir. physical? No, sir. And you two were separated? Yes, sir. And at this point, you were not in fear of injury? No, sir. And you were not in fear for your life? No, sir. Uh, so sometime later during this party, there is another argument between uh, you and Mr. Cooper. We'll call this the second encounter. And uh, I believe here it's where you testified Mr. Cooper said he'd kill you. Mm -hmm. 
You say I'm a Marine. I can kill you with my bare hands. So that's not what you said on direct. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't say that on direct, but that's what he said. So we've got now Marines and Air Force. I don't think he knew anything about me. I didn't know he was in the Marines until he made that statement like that. And this is the encounter that the, basically the DJ engineered. I'm not faulting him for tricking you or anything, but it's when DJ Bones, hey, let's just let's see if we can, I think you use the term, squash this, yes, yes. squash the beef. And, yeah. and you said, all right, I'll go talk to the guy. It didn't squash so well. Exactly, Your Honor. Uh, and, and this argument escalates to a physical struggle. Yes, sir. And it's your assertion that Mr. Cooper punched you. Yes, he did. And a drink that you were holding fell on Mr. Cooper. No. It fell on me. It fell on you. I'm sorry. No, no, sir. You're yeah. fine. Um, at this point in time, did you have a firearm on your person? No. And during the struggle, uh, you and Mr. Cooper, you're, you're physically separated. Yes, sir. And at this point, were you in, you weren't in fear for injury, were you? Rephrased, I don't. After the second encounter when is we were over, separated. you're physically separated. You're not in fear of receiving injury at this point, are you? It's questionable because I didn't know this guy. And for him to get that belligerent like that in front of all those people, I started looking at him from the side of my eye. But you're separated. Yes, we are. And you're not injured at that point. No. And he's not anywhere near you. No. And you're not in fear for your life at this point. I can't 100% say I'm not to you at this point. But you didn't leave the party at this time. No, sir, I did not. Uh, nobody took your car keys from you? No, sir. You had access to your car? Yes, sir. You could have driven your car? Yes, sir. You had your cell phone on you at the party? For most of the party until I went to go plug it up. You didn't call anybody for a ride? No, sir. You didn't call a taxi? No, sir. You didn't order an Uber? No, sir. You didn't order a lift? No, sir. You didn't walk away from the party? No, sir. You didn't get on a bus? No, sir. You didn't get on a train? No, sir. I think I got it. He stayed at the party. Seven hours. We had second encounter. Seven hours pass. It's time to leave. And then we're at, um, we're standing by the truck. So at some point during these seven hours, you called uh, Mr. DeAndre Royals? Yes, sir. Uh, would you say that was at about nine o'clock p.m.? No, it was early in that day. It was still daylight. No, it wasn't nine. Or... It was still daylight. Yes. Do you recall on that phone call, you said, DeAndre, get your line brother Kendrick because I'm going to shoot his ass? No. You've known Mr. Royals for years? Yes, sir. All right, did you graduate college with him? We graduated from the same college, different years. Thank you for clarifying yes, sir. that. Yes, sir. Uh, he's a friend of yours. He's a colleague. During that call, did Mr. Royals tell you to calm down? No, sir. I don't recall that. And you still stayed at the party? Yes, sir. So I'm going to move ahead to the third encounter. Um, would you say that's at about 1130 p.m.? Around 11 or so. Yes, sir. Something like that. I don't know the exact time. Um, on direct, you, you said that you saw Kendrick Cooper running at you. Did you know that he was leaving the party? At that exact moment? No, I did not. Uh, did you see him in a car at all? He was running from a car. I didn't see him in a car. I saw him running from a car. So you didn't see him get out of a car? No. Can you walk me through at what point you armed yourself uh, with the handgun? May I stand up? Uh, sure. Well, I don't need to stand up. When I, when I, like I said, when we were leaving, I went to the back of my truck and I got my phone charger out 
along with the long cord. My gun was in the back, I grabbed my gun and I walked to the front of my car because I'm licensed to carry and I keep my gun in the car all the time since my military career in different states. So yeah. why your gun was in your car, just happened to be in the back. Yeah. Why did you move it from the back to the front? I'm about to drive. So you want it near you. Yeah. It's not helpful to have it way in the back. Okay. So that's how it came to be on me. So you didn't arm yourself after the first encounter. You didn't arm yourself after the second encounter. So it was only as you was were getting, ready, getting to ready to leave. Yes, sir. Do you always arm yourself before you uh, get in the car? I don't understand the question. Every time you get in a car, yeah, you I, arm yourself. Yeah, I, I, I take my, my weapon is used 99.9% .9 of the time my weapon is in my car or my, one of my vehicles, yes. Is it your typical practice when you get in the car to put the firearm on your hip or in a holster? No, no. When I'm in my car, my gun is one of two places. It's in under the seat where I can get to it or it's in my glove box. I don't own a holster. I don't carry it out in the public. It's in my vehicle or in my home. Why was it in the back of the truck to begin with? And why wasn't it already under the seat or in the glove box? Because someone breaking my car, they won't be able to get that to get my weapon. because It's in the back. It's kind of like hidden. They won't oh. be able to get my weapon. They break in the car. This is no disrespect. This is Atlanta. No, I know. And, and people leaving guns in car are irresponsible people, um, especially when it's in the center console, because that's the first place people look. So you had, upon arriving at Mr. Swain's, moved the gun to the back so that if someone punched your window and looked around, they might get some change, um, but they don't find the gun yeah, unless my, they're going away in the back. My gun in my wallet was in the back. Okay. So you typically don't arm yourself when you get in a car, but you did on May 15th, 2021. I didn't arm myself. I took my wallet that was in the back and my gun. And I brought it back to the front because I was getting ready to leave. I didn't arm myself. I took my gun from the back, grabbed my wallet. I grabbed my cell phone and my laptop charger and I brought it to the front of the car where I was getting in. But that's not your typical practice. No, sir. And you uh, testified on direct that you saw Cooper running from a stop sign towards you. And that was at about, I believe you said 200 feet away? Approximately, yes. Uh, at that point, you didn't get in your car? No, sir. And you didn't attempt to leave the area? No, sir. Despite him being 200 feet away? Yes, sir. And uh, I understand that, that you said uh, his hand was behind his back and he had one hand pointing at you. Yes, sir. And he said, motherfucker, I'll kill you or some variation thereof. Yes, sir. You said Christopher Swain was near you. Yes, sir. Miss, Mr. Swain, he wasn't panicked, was he? I'm not sure if he was panicked or not. He was something that he actually tried to stop cooper so he felt something i guess and you didn't hear anyone say gun no sir and when mr cooper was running at you did he have any brass knuckles on that you could see no sir i couldn't see his hand you could see one of his hands one the hands you saw so no i did not see any brass knuckles sir uh did you see him with a knife no sir did you see him with a gun no, sir. So he was unarmed? I don't know. And uh, did you see Mr. Swain with any weapons? No, sir. Now, I think Judge did a, did a good job before of uh, breaking down this lunge when you said Mr. Cooper lunged at you. It's, uh, it's your assertion that I think when you demonstrated it with Miss Hawkins, so the record's clear. Yes, sir. Miss Hawkins' left hand was behind her back, and her right hand was up. Yes, sir. And that was a, an accurate 
your accurate recollection of how Cooper was when he was lunging towards you? Yes, sir. Was, was he bent forward at all with his head towards you? No, sir. And his left arm remained behind his back throughout this entire lunge. Yes, sir. And you said that he got about two feet away from you. That was um, from when Miss Hawkins was standing in front of you just a few moments ago. Within, within two feet. So now after the shooting, you transported Mr. Swain to Grady Hospital. Yes, sir. And at Grady, uh, you gave statements to Atlanta police officers, correct? Yes, sir. You willingly gave those statements? Yes, sir. You weren't threatened or coerced? No, sir. Nobody offered you anything in exchange for a statement? No, sir. So they were freely and voluntarily made? Yes, sir. It, it sounds like in addition to that, they were made after you had an opportunity to consult with counsel. Not these lawyers, but Mr. Hurd and you had a discussion. And I don't want you to share with me anything he told you, but it was after you spoke with Mr. Hurd, and I think you said he told you, go ahead and do it, that you agreed to speak with the officers. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So do you recall giving a statement to Officer York before any attorneys arrived on scene? No, sir. Uh, so, so you don't recall making a statement that Cooper was popping off at the mouth and directed towards you, I'll kill you? The statement that I recall was made to the officers while my attorney was standing with me. Um, now, he, I did make a statement that said he was going to kill me, but I don't re recall uh, Officer York or me, him, sidebar, no. Do you recall the names of any of the officers? No, uh, honestly, Your Honor, I don't know the names of none of the officers. Sure. So we could have had an Officer York there. It could have been an Officer Jones or yes. Bernie or Thomas or yes. it could have been Foster. Yes, it could okay. have been. And Your Honor, it appears that we are transitioning from an immunity motion to a Jackson Deno hearing, and I think that this is the inappropriate time to do that. Well, um, two things. Um, I think we are uh, very efficiently killing two birds with one stone, especially given the fact that you withdrew your motion to suppress the statement. Um, we may well have um, uh, made clear that the requirements of Jackson v. Deno were met, but irrespective of that, um, I think in the same way that it was appropriate for you to explore with your client, um, and I think your question was along the lines of, did you tell the police the same thing you told us, or at least that was your client's answer, um, that uh, Mr. Costello can explore with your client um, what he thinks the record shows he told the police in case they're inconsistencies, because that will go to this witness's credibility, which is about 95% of the immunity motion. So I'm going to allow him to explore it. I don't want us to get into six days later what happened, unless it's relevant to credibility of this witness. Okay, I, I'll, I'll cross that bridge when we get, when we get there, because I think there was something that was getting ready to happen, but okay. I'll cross that bridge when we All get right. there. All right, and, and continue to object if we're hitting a bridge you're worried about. The bridge of, hey, this seems like Jackson Deno. I agree, but great, let's check that box, because we're gonna need to cross that bridge if this goes to trial in a relatively informal way, because you withdrew your motion. If it's a bridge of irrelevance or hearsay or something like that, keep keep objecting. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Judge. So, Mr. Thomas, you know, if, if you made a statement to Officer York at Grady Hospital on May 16th of 2021, you wouldn't recall um, giving a statement where you never said anything to the officer about seeing the defendant's hand behind his back. No, I don't recall that. And uh, Judge, can I approach the witness? You may. Both sides can approach witnesses unless you hear me say, don't do that anymore. Thank you, Judge. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Thomas, I'm, I'm showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Number One. Yes, sir. It is a body camera from Officer York. Uh, it contains a statement that you made to him um, on May 16th of 2021 at 80 Jesse Hill Jr. Drive. Okay. Um, if you had a opportunity to explain why you or, or i'd like to actually just give you the opportunity to explain why you your testimony today that you don't remember giving a statement or you don't remember giving a statement about not seeing a hand behind his back for the court uh, because it's my assertion i believe you omitted that in your first statement to police i remember talking to 
police officers at Grady. I don't remember the exact words, but I don't remember also uh, telling what the macro of the conversation was with me in the officers. I spoke to about three or four officers that night. I don't know what's the macro of the conversation verbatim, verbiage. And uh, you did give a second statement to um, a group of officers. That'd be officers Vickers, officers York, and officer Barnett. Um, and during this statement, you said Cooper rushed and said, I'll kill you. Do you remember giving that statement at all? Yeah, don't know the officers, but I remember it was a group of officers, about five or six throughout the, that night at Grady in that parking lot. And do you remember demonstrating for those officers uh, what Cooper did prior to you shooting him? Demonstrating? Like I yeah, said, similar to how a judge had you demonstrate for the court. Um, not exactly. So you wouldn't remember demonstrating that Cooper's hand was down at his side when he rushed you? No, I don't, I don't remember. And I'm uh, just going to approach and show you what's been marked as state's exhibit number two. Of exhibit course. number two is yes. also it's a body camera uh, of Officer Vickers where Officer Barnett is present. Okay. And, you know, you, again, you don't recall demonstrating for officers that when you were rushed, uh, Cooper's hand was down at his side. No, sir. And I just want to give you an opportunity to explain maybe any inconsistencies from today based on right. that statement back then. And I appreciate that, but I don't um, recall the ergonomics of displaying uh, how Mr. Cooper was standing or where was his hands. I, I don't recall that. But I do remember speaking to multiple officers. You uh, touched a little bit on direct about your military training and experience. So you're familiar, or how, how much training have you had hours wise um, in firearms training? I couldn't give you an exact number. So you, uh, you said you did 20 years in the military? Yes, well, at a minimum, you yearly go to firearms training at a minimum. And uh, roughly how many hours is that one yearly qualification you made? At a minimum to do? Of, a, of an airman, we, uh, an eight hour range day. So, over the course of 20 years, at a minimum, you would have 160 hours of firearms training. Okay. And during those 160 hours of training, you've learned how guns work. Yes, sir. And you've learned uh, that when you point a firearm at something uh, and you pull the trigger, a round discharges and goes in the direction of the muzzle of the firearm. You're correct. Yes, sir. And in your training, are you given specific parameters of when you're allowed to point a firearm at something? Yes, sir. And when? When would be an appropriate situation to do that? Uh, now my military training is when you're in defense of yourself, you're in defense of government property, such as I worked the flight line, aircraft, um, or classified information. You can shoot someone to keep them away from classified information? Certain scenarios, yes, Your Honor. Huh. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Certain, certain scenarios, not could have gotten dangerous down in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and uh when when you say to protect yourself uh is is that from somebody punching you in the face it doesn't uh itemize a scenario sir but to protect oneself from bodily harm so it doesn't itemize uh scenarios of uh protection now, I, I also think you testified about this on direct, so please correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, sir. But did you say that you've um, assisted in training police in the use of firearms? Yes, 
far as marksmanship, my first two years in the military I was combat arms training and maintenance. So we ran pretty much the base ranges, wherever you were stationed, you ran the range. Um, uh, you did purchase orders for weapons and you kept everybody that was TDY applicable or that would go to a foreign country or war. You keep everybody, everybody must be certified. Some get certified biannually, some get certified annually. So we ran the range. So every day on the ranges, you're gonna have a, a group flight squadron of troops come in to get their yearly training. So yes. And when you uh, were involved in, in this aspect of training, did you, did you teach officers about when they're allowed to use deadly force or forced to effect an arrest or something similar? No, no. Uh, you testified on direct that when you got to Grady, you called an attorney. On oh, my way to Grady, sir. Yes, sir. Way to Grady. Yes, sir. Why did you do that? Uh, no disrespect to you, but for common sense, something had just happened, tragic, and I was involved, and I wanted instantly to clear my name, but also, once I get down there, I knew I was going to try to talk to someone and explain what happened, and just in case I was arrested, I needed someone to represent me and to protect me and to be an advocate for me. I believe you mentioned on direct that um, some of the things Mr. Cooper was doing, it wasn't the time uh, or the place for it, but it was the time or place to bring out a gun. I was transitioning from the back of my truck to the front of my truck. It was, uh, I don't, sir, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm just, trying to get my verbiage right to respond. That's okay, take your time. It wasn't an appropriate time or inappropriate time. I was transitioning my personal belongings from the back of my truck to the front. And just a few more questions, just to clear a couple of points up that I have here. Um, you testified on direct, when, when you made your phone call to DeAndre Royals, uh, you, you mentioned that you were perturbed Perturbed? On direct? You said that you were perturbed at that time. Okay. But you didn't leave the party then? No, sir. Uh, you also testified about Jamal Carter uh, informing you that Coop had gotten into it with a guy named Bruce. No, I didn't say Jamal told me. So you, you got I, information from yes. someone Yes, sir. You've gotten into it with Bruce. Yes, sir. And you didn't leave then. No, sir. Just one moment, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Thomas, you said earlier that, that you consumed alcohol at the party. Yes, earlier that day. Uh, how much? I don't know, maybe a drink or two. I can't give you an exact. What, what is a drink for you? Is it half a beer? Is it a fifth of vodka? What, when you say you had a drink, I don't know what they were serving. Okay. Um, the infamous red plastic cups. Yeah, the yes. solo cups. Solo cup, yes. <laughs> yeah. Don, I had, uh, it would have been two, but one drink got punched out of my hand. Right. So that first one was a Tito's and tonic. Yes, sir. Okay. So you only had one, one Tito's and tonic. Yes. Throughout the nine to 10 hours you were at this party. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I think that's all I have, Judge. Thank you. All right. Uh, Ms. Hawkins, do you have any redirect for Mr. Thomas? Absolutely, Your Honor. Mr. Thomas, you weren't on that until about holiday, correct? No, ma'am. And this was, again, a party, um, barbecue, family and friends party. Yes, ma'am. And on the cross, you, the ADA asked you, you brought a gun to a cookout. Um, 
you bring your gun everywhere you go. Right? Yeah, it's, it stays in my, my uh, vehicle. So you didn't wake up that morning. Well, you didn't know you were going to a cookout. You didn't um, drive to the to the cookout saying, hey, I'm going to bring my gun. No. And I'm going to pull it out. No. And I'm going to shoot somebody. No, ma'am. Okay. Um, and you were also asked on cross, were you injured during the second encounter? The second encounter is when you were punched in the face, right? Yes. Objection leading. So um, some of the questions were there. I think you were orienting the witness, but it's redirect. It's not recross. Most of your questions have ended with right, um, but this is your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Sure. What happened during that second encounter? The second encounter, when I saw how loud and he started cussing again, I told the DJ, I said, this is not going to work pretty much. I was like, I'm good. I'm good. And that's when I um, told Cooper that uh, Mr. Cooper, I said, I'm show you something called a little deference. I say, you know what? We ain't not going to talk. I say, uh, frat brothers, fix me a drink and I'm going to fix you one. What are you drinking? Let me fix you a drink. And that's when he punched me. Were you injured? I didn't bleed, but yes, he punched me in my face. Um, and when you fired, your one shot, were you, what were you protecting yourself from? Mr. Cooper. Um, I'm, if, if I'm not mistaken, on cross, um, the state asked you, were you protecting yourself? You were using your gun to protect yourself from a punch. The punch happened, when did the punch happen? The first, second, or third encounter? Second. Okay. And when did the shot happen? Third. And that's when Mr. Cooper was lunging at you. Yes, ma'am. And is that when you pulled your firearm to protect yourself? Yes, ma'am. And at that time, where was Mr. Cooper's hand as he was lunging at you? I saw the one hand at this point above shoulder, and I didn't see the other hand. So two hands. I didn't see two. One was visible okay. and one was not. Yes, ma'am. And about how many times did Mr. Cooper tell you he could kill you? Me directly, probably about, I want to say around three, but he said it throughout the day. To different people, he was getting into it with a couple of people, but to me directly, about three. Three in that final encounter, or three if you think through all the times you and I, you and he exchanged words. That final encounter, maybe two. That second encounter, one. Okay. All right, um, Mr. Um, Costello, any recross? Just uh, very briefly, Judge. Uh, so you, you just testified that. Mr. Cooper told you he was going to kill you during the second encounter. He said, I kill you, motherfucker. I kill you with my bare hand. That's the Marine cliche statement. But you still stayed at the party. Yes. That's all, Judge. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Thomas, you may step down. We're going to take our morning break. Um, it'll be about 10 minutes. We can go until a little afternoon. Then you guys will get an hour for lunch, and I will go to the bench meeting. So um, you do you have more witnesses to call? Yes, just Mr. Carter out of turn. I'll reach out to him um, while we're on this break. Got it. Um, you don't think he's available right now? No, Your Honor. All right, so you're gonna, we're gonna leave um, your evidence open for Mr. Carter, and that would be the Jalen Carter I heard about, Jamal. J Jamal Carter, the gentleman who was next to the truck when this happened, Jamal Carter, right? Yes, Your Honor. Different Carter. Um, uh, all right, so are you planning on putting on any evidence, Mr. Costello? Uh, yes, Judge, I can anticipate I will have Christopher Swain, Kendrick Cooper, uh, Mr. Maddox, and then I also have two officers uh, that would be used to uh, introduce uh, impeaching inconsistent statements. Okay, um, whoever you're gonna call first is around and can be here in now nine minutes. I believe so. Great. All right. So when we get back, um, we'll have you call your first witness 
and we'll get Mr. Carter in the mix once we know he's available. So if you all could try to pinpoint when that'll be, that's great. Um, and maybe he can be a little flexible so we don't interrupt uh, a state's witness. But um, if you say, hey, two-ish would work, then when we finish with a state's witness around two, hopefully we could get Mr. Carter um, on the Zoom, but I can put him in the waiting room so he can't see and hear what's going on. Okay? Sounds good. All right, I'll see you all in about eight minutes. Thank you. Mr. Thomas, you can step off. All right, Ms. Rivers, you good? Let's get back on the record. Um, Mr. Costello, who's your first witness going to be? Judge, state would like to call Mr. Frederick Maddox to the stand. Mr. Maddox. First of Maddox, F R E D E R I C K, last name Maddox, M A D D O X. Mr. Maddox, I'm Judge McBurney. It's nice to meet you. Um, I need to make sure, you need to make sure when you're testifying that you get close to the microphone so we can hear you and make sure you speak slowly. You just spelled your name in record time and you're not going to get to leave earlier just because you talk fast. You'll have to say everything four times if you talk fast. So um, I may not want to be here, maybe a little nervous. I get all that, but just make sure you, you speak slowly. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Mr. Costello. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Maddox, uh, what county and state do you currently live in? Uh, DeKalb County in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, what do you do for a living? I do tattoos. And uh, do you have any particular ties to any fraternities? No, sir. Can you describe for the court how you may know Christopher Swain? Um, I know Chris because I used to date his sister. Do you know anybody by the name of Kendrick Cooper? Yes. And how do you know Mr. Cooper? Um, I know him mutually through Chris, through Chris uh, Swain. <laughs> and do you know um, Mr. Phil Thomas? No, doesn't. So I want to draw your attention to May 15th of 2021. Before we get there, just so I, more context. You used to date Mr. Swain's sister. Did that situation end in a bad way or it was mutual? Hey, it's been nice, but we're going to go separately. Oh, yeah, it was mutual. We mutual. Did. Okay. Yeah. So, like, you and Swain don't have an issue because mm. you weren't good to his sister or anything. Like no, nah, me, me, actually, me and her, we still, you know, we're still friends. It's okay. Just, it's just know, not that way anymore. Yeah. No. Okay. Got it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Judge. Um, Mr. Maddox, I'm going to draw your attention to May 15th of 2021. Do you recall attending any parties or cookouts that day? Yes, it was at the house. Um, and when you say the house, was it Chris Swain's house? Yes. Yeah, can we approach for just a brief second, please? Sure. Yeah, you can all. In fact, well, let me just just try right here. If we need to go outside. Of the outside. Okay. I can make that clear. And when Mr. Swain testifies, you should feel free to. Well, you should feel free to ask. Thanks. Ms. Foster, is that? person in here now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. When you're ready, Mr. Costello. Thank you, Judge. Um, all right, Mr. Maddox. So uh, you were at Chris Swain's house. I believe that was the last question I asked. Yes. Sir. Uh, does 688 South Elizabeth Place sound like the address for Mr. Swain's house? Yes, sir. Is that located in Fulton County? Yes, sir. Uh, do you know what the party was for? Um, man, when we came up, it was just you know, a lot of um, frat brothers that was there. So it just, 
to my knowledge, it was just a, a get together with all the the brothers, the bros. This would be Omegas, and you're not an Omega, but it was all right for you to be there because you and Swain are our friends. Yes. Were you dating Mr. Swain's sister at the time? Yes. Okay. So that might have been another reason why it was okay for you to be there. Yes. Was she there? Yes. And uh, you were a guest at this party? Yeah. Well, and um, what time did the party start? You remember? Mm, we was already um, gone from the house at the time. When we got back, it was already started. Like It was already going. And do you remember uh, what time you may have gotten there? Um, I think we pulled back up to the house, maybe like 7.30, 8 o'clock between that time frame. Uh, so you got there at 7.30 p.m. Did you, were you aware of any kind of physical altercations that took place at the party at that point? No. Between the hours of 7.30 and 11.30, were you at that party? Yes. During those four hours or so, were you aware of any physical altercations? Um, yes. Uh, did you witness any of them personally? Yes. And what did you witness? Um, and, uh, I witnessed the argument, holding back, weapon drawn, a shot. So uh, you, you actually saw a shooting? Yeah. Um, yes. Was it so you? The word you used was "I witnessed argument, holding back, weapon drawn." Is that all one incident, or you saw three different okay, things? That, that was all one incident, as into the argument going on, leading to them being held back from each other, and then from being held back from each other, a, a weapon was drawn, and yeah, it was all in one. It was all in the same incident. One situation. Okay, I assume you're going to dissect this. I am. Joking. Okay, all right. I just want to make sure that was all one thing. It sounds like it evolved ultimately into a, a gun being drawn. Yeah, from, okay. from starting from the argument. Okay. So prior to this weapon being brought out and this argument and shooting, did you see anything else occur personally before that at this party? No. Um, during the party, uh, did you drink any alcohol? No, I wouldn't. Did you use any drugs? No. So I want to break down um, this incident that you witnessed. Uh, do you know who was involved in this incident? Um, I only know Cooper. The other, the other person, I don't, I don't know him personally. I don't even remember his name. Okay. Can you describe for the court as specifically as you can mm -hmm. what you saw? All right. Well, it started when I was upstairs, um, switching out, you know, changing my clothes, and then I heard the arguing downstairs in the living room. Once I, I, I didn't really pay too much attention because, you know, the frat brothers it was drinking. I know how loud it gets. So when you think about it. Once it escalated outside, that's when I looked out the window and seen that everybody was outside. We go outside, still see them arguing. As we see them arguing, I see um, Cooper, he get held back because at this point it had done escalated more to what it was already. And from Cooper being held back and the other person, I don't know his name, from him being this trying to distance himself at the time, that's when I had already seen his weapon drawn. So while his weapon was drawn at that moment from Cooper, you know, breaking breaking out of the hell back as into still trying to communicate and how it was, next thing you know, bang, through and through, hit Cooper to hit Swain in his leg. Okay. I just want to clear up um, a couple of things for the record mm -hmm. um so you uh you can't you're inside the house and you noticed that there was some sort of argument and then you went outside it was the arguments were the well as when i was told the arguments were starting in the living room but they was already loud at that point so we didn't think that it was arguing but once it went outside to notice that it was an argument that's when i went outside behind everybody to 
Okay, so you were outside and uh, you witnessed an argument outside of the house. Outside of the house, yes. And that argument was involving who? Um, Cooper and the other dude. I don't, I don't know. I don't know his name. And, and that's fine. And you know, if you refer to him as the other dude, <laughs> it's okay. I just want to make sure that we distinguish between Cooper and there was another part. Yes. How long did this argument between Cooper and the other dude, how long did it last? By, by the time I got outside, give or take, what I, what I remember, give or take 10 to 15 minutes. As they was trying, as they were arguing, but still trying to calm it down. Yeah, about 10, 15 minutes from my my taking it from when I um got outside. During those 10 to 15 minutes, um, did I know you've already said that other dude had a gun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you see anybody else outside with a weapon of any type? No. So Cooper was unarmed? Yes. And when we're talking about weapons. Um, I'm asking about brass knuckles, pepper spray, knives, guns, anything like that scene. I didn't see nothing else but a, uh, a gun. And how long into the argument was it when other dude brought out a gun? Mm, from the argument, when they seen it, give it um, probably about 10 minutes. I don't know. I don't, I don't know to when I got outside for about 10 minutes because when they was trying to, as they were separating them, as they was trying to get the distance from them, once he made his way around on the other side, that's when I seen that it was drawn because of how he was holding it with his hand. Like, as so, he, so there was there was 10 minutes of back and forth before you saw a weapon. Yes. After the weapon was drawn. Explain for the judge what you saw. Before you get to that, um, Mr. Costello just said the weapon was drawn. Did you see the other dude actually pull the gun from a waistband or a holster or just for a while you saw people with just hands and the next thing you noticed, hey, this guy's got a gun in his hand. Exactly what I saw. You don't know if someone handed it to him or it fell from the sky or he pulled it out of his waist. No, I, don't, I can't tell you if somebody handed it to him or he pulled it, but all I know is he was, it was drawn and it was in his hand. Got it. And when you say it was in his hands, his hand was at his side, so there's a gun in his hand or it was pointed in the direction of... He had the barrel. The barrel was down. Okay. So as he had the barrel down, as in like, you know, I'm getting ready. I, if, if need be, got it. I can I'm letting that. everyone who's looking at me know I, I got a piece in my hand. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't under a shirt or anything like that. Cause you could see it. Yeah. Okay. And um, so I think my last question was Mr. Maddox. Um, after you noticed that the other dude had a weapon, mm -hmm. how much longer uh, did the argument last? When, once um, I seen that he had a weapon, you know, we back out, they still arguing. Give or take two, three minutes. Right after that, next thing you know, pow. Okay, so um, kind of walk Judge McBurney through those two to three minutes up to the gunshot. What exactly did you see? All right, so as he was trying to steal, he was actually trying to get his distance from Cooper as well. And when you say he, can you just clarify who he is? The other dude. Other dude, gotcha. <laughs> and when you say, you said this several times now, he was trying to get his distance. Were there people preventing the other dude from moving away or was he up against the wall? So he had actually just trying to, you know, everybody was just trying to deescalate the situation at mm -hmm. that point. Why, you know, why the weapon was drawn at that point? Because it was like, you know, we're out here having a party. You don't need to have a weapon right now. During, you know, from it, the argument was going on and everything too. So as he, I can say, as he was trying to distance himself while the gun was drawn and shown, it was like I said, between them two or three minutes while he did it, it was still arguing. Um, I wanna I wanna say um well, let me let me help you out here, Miss Mr. Maddox, mm -hmm. and kind of keep you um on a on a track. Um in those two to three minutes right before the shooting, what did you notice Cooper doing? 
he was still arguing as he's being held back, just still, you know, just still talking, but it was just literally strictly talking. Would you say he was yelling? But everyone was, but yeah. Did you um, hear Mr. Cooper use, you know, some pretty explicit language? From both parties. At any point in time, um, did you see Mr. Cooper doing anything specific towards other dude? No. All I literally seen was just, it was just arguing. It was as if, you know, trying to, you know, try to get in each other's face for the argument, but it was still on the, everybody keeping, everybody trying to keep the, 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 the space and the distance between them. So like any other sudden movement, nah, I don't remember seeing anything. Uh, about how far away was Cooper from the other dude? Mm. Why don't you, I don't want you to have to guess. Why don't you tell Mr. Costello where he should stand? You're the other dude. So you got, you did a good job showing me where the gun was. So you're the other dude. Where should Mr. Costello stand so that he is where someone is holding Cooper back? Okay. I'll stand up. Sure. As he's trying to get a distance from where it was. Okay, and I want you to stay right there for a second, both of you, because I'm still trying to figure out what you're describing the other dude is doing. I got it that you said Cooper's still talking, fussing, jawing, and people are maybe holding them back a little bit. Um, and what what is anyone doing, if anything, to the other dude? Are they holding him back? Okay. Okay. But what was behind him? Could he have walked away or were there people behind him? Okay. Got it. Thank you. And, uh, and just for the record, Judge, estimating the distance between Mr. Maddox and I, my wingspan is about six foot three. So I think it's probably between six and a half and seven feet distance. Okay, that's your estimate. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mr. Maddox. So we have other dude is holding a handgun, a weapon. We have Cooper yelling. He's about six, seven feet away. What happened next? Um, as he, as Cooper break away. From everybody still, you know, still trying to do it. As he break away, boom. Hit him in the stomach through and through. Chris, Chris Swain, he was behind him. He hit him in the leg. And when you say uh, he hit him, are you saying that other dude shot yeah. Cooper? Other dude shot him. He went through and through. He Chris Swain in the leg. Okay. And um, do you recall what Cooper was doing with his hands just prior to the shooting as in like he's seen, as i from what i've seen as he's seeing the gun i guess trying to block the bullet <laughs> so like, could you could you demonstrate for the judge what you saw cooper do with his hands right before the shooting um as he breaks as he break away all i seen was just his hand gesture Literally and just his hand gesture no fist balled up no I'm in a defense mode or attack mode, none of that. All I seen was his hands up in this general way. That's all I remember. And just, just for I the seen. record, the witness did put both of his hands up towards his torso, towards his shoulders, and had his palms open. Um, well, Cooper, I, I, right. That you say Cooper did. Cooper He's just did. saying the witness, you, were demonstrating what you recall Mr. Cooper doing. And I, I saw the same thing you saw, where Mr. Maddox has both hands up, um uh palms facing outward in front of his chest thank you judge and um after you saw other dude shoot coop what do you recall happening next mr maddox as it went as it went through he was in shock as in like he got shot and we didn't know that chris was hit at the time until he yells out you shot me and pass out because he got hit in the artery and his thigh and um what happened after um you guys realized there, there were people shot um from me being in the military the you know, certified emt just jumped right in y'all apply pressure to his stomach 
hold it in the back. Somebody give me a belt. I'm going to apply a tourniquet to Chris' leg so we can hold it down. Yo, why are we You're still- talking about what you did? Yes. So you're a former military with EMT training? Yes. Got it. And were you describing what was done to both people who were shot? Yes. Um, so so you helped render aid or directed someone to render aid to Mr. Cooper? Mr. Cooper, while I render aid to Chris Swain. So you were hands-on with Swain? Yes. And telling people what they needed to do with yes. Cooper? And uh, did what did you do with Mr. Swain? Um, I got a belt. Someone gave me their belt. Um, wrapped around the leg tight to where I can, um, <laughs> you know, stop, try to stop the bleeding and holding it. We got him up, put him in the car, and we drove to Grady, both of them. And, uh, and uh, after you arrived at Grady, uh, did that really conclude your involvement in this incident? Once we got to Grady, and yeah, I told the officers, you know, what I seen, what I knew, yeah, that was it. Okay. Judge, I don't think I have anything further for Mr. Maddox. All right. I've got a couple more questions, and then um, Ms. Hawkins or Ms. Foster may have questions for you. So you've described Mr. Cooper as, as breaking away. Someone was holding him back. Was it Mr. Swain who was holding him back, or you just know there were people holding him back? It was just people that were just out there. Okay. Um, he was being held back. Other dude not being held back or propelled, he, he's standing his ground mm-hmm. with the gun in his hand. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Meaning yes? Yes. Okay. Um, When Mr. Cooper broke free, you've described how his hands were, both hands in front of him, palms forward, open. Um, Was he approaching the other dude or did he simply just break free? Because they're two different things. You break free and you're standing still. Another is you break free and you're coming um, madly at other dude. No, he just, he literally just broke free because it was, Everybody just kept grabbing while he was just simply saying he was just trying to talk, but he broke free. And like I said, it was it was noticeable that other dude already had his weapon drawn. So it was on some like I see it. I'm still trying to, you know, talk. So you you had Mr. Costello stand in a certain point that you estimate um, was about how far apart Mr. Cooper and other dude were um, when the shooting happened. Um, so as I'm understanding your testimony, uh, Mr. Cooper broke free and was effectively stationary with his hands up uh, yes. when he got shot. That's as far away as he was when he got shot. Or did he actually take four steps towards other dude and the shooting was they were two feet apart? At that point, at that moment, I really honestly can't say mm-hmm. It was chaos. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, You did place Mr. Cooper and other dude um, uh, as far apart as you did, however many feet that is, seven, eight. Um, uh, Your recollection is, and then it just, there was a shooting and it got real crazy. And I I know Cooper didn't move forward or actually Cooper was basically right on top of this guy when he fired. You're you're not sure what happened in that one? At that moment, no. Okay. Thank you. Questions from the defense. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Pablo over here. Mr. Maddox, I'm attorney Chen Wei Foster. I represent Phil Thomas. I believe that's who you can refer to as other dude. I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, Mr. Maddox, you would agree that um, you spoke with the officer on May uh, 16th of 2021, correct? Yes, ma'am. You would agree that your memory was fresh. And you were fresh in 2021 than it is now, two years later, correct? Yes. And you would admit that what you told the officers on the day in question was probably more accurate than what you're saying today, yes, correct? Ma'am. And since the incident in 2021, um, who all have you talked to about this case? Um, I left it alone after we talked to the officers that night. Like, it was on um, you know Chris Cooper and your client as well. So I I didn't know that I had anything else to talk about it. We just left it alone. Right. Yes, ma'am. And so you're telling and your David Swain's sister. Yes, right? ma'am. And your friend with Swain. Yes. Are you telling the court that you haven't talked about the state since high school? No, I haven't. You would not talk to anyone. From the day of, from everything? No, I haven't. I honestly forgot about it until I got called to come into court. You forgot that your friend uh, Cooper was shot and your friend Swain was shot? 
no, I'm not gonna forget about it. I just I just thought that stuff had already been handled as as far as what I'm saying because of the the time frame of how long it's been since then. You didn't realize how long it takes us to move cases in Fulton County. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> dang, this was May 21. They've got to be done with it. Just something, yeah. <laughs> yeah, welcome to Fulton. So when you've spoken to Cooper and Plains, it's May 2021. No, today was my first day seeing Cooper since. And the last time I spoken with Swain was about a job in January. So when you saw Cooper today, did you speak with him about what happened to May? No. And so you've not talked to your friend Cooper at all? No. From May until today? Not spoken to him at all? Mm, no. You sure about that? No. You're not sure? I haven't talked to him, no. I'm sure, but I haven't talked to him. And you have talked to him, but it was just about the job? Yes. And you've not talked to his sister? No. Okay. Now, on the day in question, you said that you got there at about 7.30. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you weren't drinking at the party, correct? No. Were you drinking previously? No. And um, when you got to the party, who did you do? Um, me and Swain's sister, her name is Dominique. We actually got to the house. We had been out because we had the kids. So while we was getting the kids situated while the party was going, we was upstairs. And These are um, Dominique's kids or your kids or you had kids together? No, she had, she had her little girl and I had my little girl. Okay, so you, your daughter and her daughter were together and you were getting them, as you said, situated upstairs. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you mentioned on the direct that at some time, one point you changed clothes. Yeah. What did you change clothes for? We was changing out from watching the day out. We had been out already, so I was taking a shower. Okay. Now, at some point, Coop also changed clothes, correct? Mm-hmm. You remember that? Yes. He was changing clothes downstairs. And he was changing clothes because his shirt was ripped, correct? No, he was getting ready to go out. After the party, more so, but you know, it got a little later on, and the party was still going. Do you recall Cooper ever telling me or anyone that he had to change clothes because his shirt was ripped? No. Did you see him change clothes? No, I saw one outfit when we got there, and then another outfit after everything was outside. Did you see him go in the bedroom to change clothes? No. Um, he was actually changing his clothes in the living room for everyone, correct? I don't know. Like I, I was upstairs while everything was downstairs was going on. So in the midst of everything, I don't know if he was in the living room or the bathroom or even the stairway because I was upstairs in the room. But I did see that he was when I got there, he was in one outfit versus two when I went downstairs after I changed clothes, he was in another outfit. And you don't recall whether his shirt was ripped or not? For him, for him to change? No, I don't. Everyone was downstairs. Did you see the other guy downstairs when you got there? Other guy meaning your client? Yeah. The other dude? Yes, I'm going to keep it going. But it's the other dude. I'm sorry. Other dude. The other dude downstairs. Why? When you went oh, no. Okay, you didn't see him, but you saw Cooper. Yes. In fact, Cooper was in the downstairs. He was arguing with a bunch of people downstairs, downstairs correct? Uh, I don't recall arguing with everybody. Like I said, it was a bunch of commotion that was just going on because it was a party. So. You said it was a commotion. In mm-hmm. fact, the director said it was an argument that you heard upstairs. Correct? Oh, yeah, because, yes, okay. that was going on. But mm-hmm. you saw Cooper, but you didn't see the other dude, mm-hmm. right? So, whoever Cooper was arguing with, it wasn't the other dude. Right? Uh, I don't know. To you know that you can see the other dude, which is all cool. So, two things. One, um, make sure you let um, Mr. Maddox completely answer before you ask your next question. And, Mr. Maddox, um, I need you, if your answer is yes, you need to say yes or yeah, but an actual word rather than uh huh, because the core reporter, it's not her role to say, was that a mm mm or a mm hmm. Um, so just make sure whatever your answer is, yes, no, maybe, I have no idea what you're talking about, that you get it out with words. Thank you. You know that you saw Cooper downstairs. Yes. You know that you didn't see the other two downstairs. Yes. You know that Cooper's army, correct? It was stuff that was going downstairs, yes. So it's, I can infer that Coop was not arguing with the other dude, right? At that moment while I was upstairs, you can say that, yes. 
and you mentioned while you were upstairs, it was loud, it was belligerent, it was a lot of commotion. Mm. With who inside? No, with it was just commotion that was just going on downstairs, as into what it like to me referring to going outside to see that okay, now it's Coop and now the other dude. But you know, whatever was going on downstairs, you know that Coop was involved. No, like I, as I stated, when we went upstairs, I didn't know that if it was an argument or anything that was going on, we didn't think nothing of it because it was already a party going on. And you mentioned that you looked out the window. As we seen that it was going outside, yes, man, to know that it was an argument. As we seen, what do you mean? What did you see oh, before upstairs? Me and Dominique, we looked out the window and we saw that, okay, now it's the commotion outside, as into, oh, the party is moved outside, but no, it's an argument outside. So you don't know whether the same individuals who were involved in the commotion down while you were upstairs in the house. You don't know whether those are the same individuals that were involved in the argument outside, right? At the time, I didn't know it was a commo. I didn't know it was an argument going on downstairs. At, you at the, hear something. Yeah, it was a party going. Like you said, the music blasting, a lot of people talking over the music. Your testimony on the rec is that you heard an argument in the living room. Why yeah. Were upstairs? yeah, but we like as I did, as I stated too, we didn't think nothing of it because we also thought that it was just going on with the party as well. To until me and Dominique, we looked outside to see that it's an argument going on, and because it done moved outside the commotion. Mm -hmm. You said it done moved, so I'm trying to clarify oh. that. <laughs> it has. You heard one argument inside, mm -hmm. right? You don't know who was involved in that argument. Okay. Mm -hmm. You heard another argument outside. Yes, ma'am. So you don't know whether they done moved from inside to outside. You heard two separate arguments inside and then outside, correct? Yes. And so when you looked out the window, you saw Coop was involved in that commotion outside, yes. correct? And is your testimony today that you saw the other dude mm -hmm. and Coop involved in an argument while you were upstairs looking out the window? That's your testimony today? As we went out, as I saw, we're going outside. No, let's not go outside yet. Okay. I'm talking about you looking out the window. Because I'm looking out the window? Yes. Mm -hmm. You said that you looked out the window and you saw an argument. Mm -hmm. Who was involved in the argument when you looked out the window? Well, I didn't know who the other dude was, but yes, I saw Coop arguing with someone okay. at the but time. Was the person you saw Coop arguing with? the other dude or it's a third person because we know in the end there is outdoors and you're outdoors there's an argument and other dude has the gun but you got it in his right hand um other dude out there um and and then someone gets shot what um miss foster is trying to get at, i think what i'm curious about is um when you first figure out there's an argument going on outside you see coop coop is in an argument he is in an argument with someone else is that someone else the guy who ultimately had a gun and shot Coop, or is it a different person? I, I honestly can't say because I just seen that as we went outside, I saw Coop, who I know, you know, just arguing, going on with the commotion since okay. everyone has went outside. Got it. Know. You just didn't know if I it was one exactly. person he was arguing with or six people. Exactly. It hadn't paired off to that scenario where it's Coop um, being held back and other dude with the gun at his waist. Yes, okay. And for my clarification, for the record, yes, you just said you don't know who Coop was arguing with when you looked out the window, correct? When I looked out the window, yes, ma'am. When you went outside, um, and when Coop was arguing, was it just talking loud or was it, were there hand movements? Were there, was he going forward? When, when, when he said, I'm safe, mm -hmm. because that's who we know. Mm -hmm. What was he doing when he was arguing? As, as I, when I made it outside mm -hmm. from you know, going to see exactly who he's arguing I'm with. Still, I'm still okay. I, I'm oh, okay. Outside. Okay. He's so, as it, as it outside, everybody moving. It was just people was trying to de-escalate the situation from moving behind Coop to. At that time, I couldn't see who he was actually arguing with to even know if it was just one person or, like the judge said, six people or not at that time. So, from while I was still upstairs to even see that is 
you know, trying to de-escalate from them arguing outside, that's when I make my way downstairs. Well, let me try to refresh. Let me try to refresh. It's let me know if your memory is not refreshed. Whatever Coop was doing, people were trying to move him to get into a car, correct? Mm, I, I, I don't know. Okay. You didn't see anyone trying to move Coop from the street to a vehicle? No, because all the cars were still parked, like as in like parked being there for the party. And then you went downstairs. What did you go downstairs for? You was trying to see what the commotion was about because of, you know, if, if you know, everybody, you know, they, they fraternity together and everything. We just trying to see, like, who's arguing? Like, who is it? Who's who's doing the drunk, the drunk talking this time, as you can say. And this is the argument was 10 to 15 minutes. So from the time you looked upstairs, there was an argument. Mm -hmm. So the time you saw the shooting was about 10 to 15 minutes. You no, know, when I got downstairs to but the shooting was by about 10, 15 minutes. Okay. But who was arguing even longer than 10, 15 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. Before I went up, before, he was already arguing before I even went downstairs to look outside. So, the, so he was already hyped up. He was live, yeah, right? Yeah, I guess you could say that. So, and as you got downstairs, <clears throat> so that's when the 10, 15 minute clock starts. Let's we got outside, yes, ma'am. Did you look at the time or you're just guessing? Just guesstimating. Mm -hmm. So it could have been shorter. Maybe. And um in the words, because you've already said that you saw Coop, you heard Coop, you know his voice. Mm -hmm. Did you have what words were you hearing from Coop specifically? <clears throat> um what I remember from back then, like um no, I'm not drunk. I'm not going nowhere. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, vaguely, yeah, I, I can't really remember all of what was said or, you know, what was really being said. We just know it was a bunch of commotion that was going on. I'm going to focus on I'm not going nowhere. Mm -hmm. So someone was telling him to go somewhere, right? You, you can say that, yeah, from him saying that. And, but you still don't recall anybody trying to get him into a car? No. <laughs> Did you hear any curse words? Yeah, everyone was cursing. Um, okay. Including the dude. And not, I'm not going to say dude. We already have the other dude. It's Phil Thomas. Okay, Mr. He's Thomas. Mm -hmm. That Phil was arguing with when you were upstairs. Mm -hmm. The guy, did you hear the guy saying curse, curse words or anything to cool? Mm, no, not right off. I don't even really remember. But we know who was loud talking about, I ain't going nowhere, I'm not drunk, he was live, mm, right? Yeah, but it was it was actually live from both parties. It was just Coop was more live, because you could say that. Part. You know that it's probably more than two, right? And she said it was a whole bunch of people upstairs. I'm not talking about that. So no, it wasn't a whole bunch of people upstairs. Me and Dominique was upstairs with the kids. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But when we get down to the standoff um, where it's Coop and the guy with the gun, um, and I think Ms. Foster was asking about this, at that point, when it's that standoff, mm -hmm. um, Coop is still loud. Mm -hmm. um, the guy with the gun, um, was he saying anything? And you don't need to tell me specifically because you may not remember. Was he silent or was there jawing in both directions? It was, yeah, it was just, it was jawing in both directions, but overall, yeah, you can hear Coop over everybody at okay. that moment. But I, I get it. Coop is loud, mm -hmm. loudest apparently, but it was, it's your recollect, is it your recollection that the guy with the gun um, wasn't standing there silently, but that um, he was saying stuff? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But you also recall a guy, the other dude, mm -hmm. trying to distance himself from Coop. Yes. Correct? Mm -hmm. And you also recall people trying to hold Coop back, right? Mm -hmm. And you also recall Coop breaking out of being held back, mm -hmm. correct? To continue to approach the guy, the other dude, correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And now one thing you didn't mention today that you mentioned when you spoke with the police back in May. Um, let's start with you. So you 
didn't go downstairs to see the fight. You actually went downstairs to move your girlfriend's vehicle, correct? No. If you told the police that, would you not tell the truth? To move the car? I, no, we weren't moving the car because we was already parked in the driveway. So, with seeing the police police report or hearing your testimony, would that refresh your recollection? Let me do this. I'll let you see the police report and you can take a look at this mm -hmm. and let me know if your memories were fresh after looking at it. <laughs> I assume Mr. Costello has whatever you're sharing. Yes. Okay. Let me go to the page Yes, ma'am. So that one of your memories are fresh. So is your memory refreshed? I don't. Your memory's not refreshed? I remember what happened, but I don't remember moving the car because we didn't need to move the car. That's not the question I'm asking. Mm. What you told the police is that you went downstairs to move your girlfriend's vehicle, correct? I don't remember that, but if it's in the report. Mm -hmm. Maybe see yourself say, well, refresh your recollection. I have it queued up, ready. So there's nothing in evidence right now? Um, I'm just trying to refresh his recollection. I can, he, he says it, you know, and he, even after seeing the report, maybe seeing himself will help, and I asked him, will help him refresh his recollection as to what he actually said and how he said it when he spoke with the police in May, 2021. Well, before we go through that exercise, and we can if we need to, um, Mr. Maddox, are you saying, I may have said that to the police, I just don't remember, or are you saying, I know I didn't, the police are wrong? I may have said it. Okay. I just don't remember, but All I right. do know from how it was from when we, when we got home, when we got to the house, I didn't have to move the car due to the fact of all the cars already moved out because Chris' car and Dominique's car was already in the driveway because everybody else was moving their car so we could put their car, so their cars can be in the driveway. I know what you're saying now. Okay. In May 2021, did you have a reason to lie to the police? No. Okay. So in May 2021, when you told the police, you notice everyone leaving the residence and you decided to go outside to move your girlfriend's vehicle. That was truthful when you told the police in May 2021, correct? Yes. Okay. And then you also told the police that you saw the victim, Mr. Cooper, rushing towards the other person with his hands in clear view, correct? Well, I just read, it, yes. Okay. And then you said what you told the police is that the victim, Mr. Cooper, approaches the suspect and said, what's up? You're going to have to shoot me, right? 
from what I just because read. Yes. Today you told me you only heard Coop saying, I'm not leaving. But she heard Coop approach the suspect and said, You're gonna have to shoot me, right? From what I just read, yes. Okay. And then you also told the police that the suspect already had his weapon out as the victim approached him, correct? As Cooper was approaching him, yes. Okay. And you also told the police that as Cooper ran, because today you're talking about an argument, but what you told the police is that the Mr. Cooper was running towards the suspect was the other dude, correct? Yes. Okay. And then you also told the police that it was two or three people that were trying to stop Mr. Cooper from approaching the suspect, right? From what I'm reading, yes. Okay. You also told the police that Cooper was able to maneuver, get away from the two people trying to stop him, correct? Yes. And you already told me that your memory was more fresh than May 2021. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You also said today, and I know, I know it was a long time ago, that you took both Coop and Swain to the hospital. You only took Cooper to Cooper the was in my car, yeah, and Swain was right behind. And what right? other dude? The other dude that you have been talking about. I never knew he took him. You also said that you wrapped a belt around Swain's leg. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you clarify that because I know that your memory was more fresh back then than it is now. Isn't it true that the other dude is a person who wrapped a towel around Swain's leg, not a belt? No. I told whoever it was to somebody give me a belt. I remember someone taking off a Gucci belt they handed it to me. I did a high and tight on his leg. On Swain or who? On Swain's leg. All right. I have another question. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, we got about five minutes. If you've got a quick redirect. Very, very quick, Judge. Great. Um, Mr. Maddox, uh, you remember giving a, a statement to the police at Grady Hospital on May 16th? Yes. Um, and that was at about uh, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning. Yes. And in that statement, did you actually recall saying uh, Coop said to the other guy, you don't have to shoot me, and the gun was already drawn? I'm not, I'm not saying for you to read from the police report. Okay. Because the police report is written by an officer, but the statement that you gave to an officer, do you remember saying, Coop said to the other guy, you don't have to shoot me, and the gun was already drawn? Yes. And so I'm, I'm showing uh, you what's been marked as exhibit number, state's exhibit number three. It's a body camera of the investigator that you gave a statement to. Okay. And I know that there's been some question about what you said today as opposed to what you said then as opposed to what's in the police report. Um, can you just explain for the court any reason why there may be an inconsistency in your testimony today? Time. I have nothing further, Judge. Ms. Foster, anything quick? Just real quick. I mean, you answered yes to the DA's question. Are you, do you actually remember or are you just answering yes to his question? No, I remember. Do you remember? Because what you told me Two minutes ago was that you said Coop said you're gonna have to shoot me. No, I reiterated and said what was written in the report as into what it was. I didn't ask you what you wrote in the report. I asked you what you told the police. And I <laughs> mentioned what was in the police report, what it was. Okay, I so didn't because I, I asked you, because are, are you for certain that that's what you said? Because I asked you seeing your video with professional recollection. And you acted like you didn't know what I was talking about. But when the DA came up here and asked you, you were so sure. So my question to you is, are you sure that that's what you said? Which, from which your, one? From your question sure about which one? Question. So this is my question. What did you say about what Coop said about shooting? What exactly did you say? I don't want you to guess because you was real sure when you, was talking, when you were talking to the DA. What In fact, you if, you, if you have to guess, then you don't remember. And it's okay to say, I don't remember.
I don't remember completely. Thank you. No further questions. All right. We are going to break for lunch. May Mr. Maddox be released? Yes, Judge. Thank you. All right, Mr. Uh, Maddox. I would actually don't want to release him. I may have to call him his rebuttal. Did you subpoena him? I did not, but he is under subpoena. Okay. Well, I was trying to help you out here, but you got to stick around. Um, important for folks who are here in court, do not leave court and talk to potential witnesses. So we know Mr. Cooper is going to testify. Mr. Swain is going to testify. Folks in here should not go out there to say, hey, this is what Maddox said. This is what the other dude said. This is what Mr. Thomas said. That's improper. That's why we're keeping those witnesses out there. They need to come in here and talk about what they remember, not what they've heard the testimony has been like in the trial so far. Um, we will reconvene at 1.10, 110 um, and uh, we will pick up with the state's next witness who you forecast to be. Christopher Swain. Okay, doesn't have to be, but it's likely going to be Mr. Swain. And Mr. Maddox, you're going to need to stick around. Um, if we're not finishing today, um, uh, would Mr. Maddox not come back tomorrow, or how do you want to manage that? I need... I, I need him to come back tomorrow because he would be a rebuttal witness based on the statements that he's made today. Okay. So he actually can go. He just needs to be back tomorrow. Or how do you want to manage it? I don't know when the state will finish or when we're going to finish. Okay. But if we are not finished today, he needs to come back tomorrow. Then I'll tell you what, I, your first direction before you all break for lunch is to talk schedule and how things are going. Are we on schedule behind ahead to give Mr. Maddox some guidance? Does he need to sit around all day? because he may be recalled as a rebuttal witness, um, or should he go about his business, but plan to be here tomorrow uh, around 9.15. So just manage his time appropriately. Thank you. I'll be back at 1.10. Your Honor, sorry. I just wanted to give you an update as far as Mr. Carter, because I did speak to him on the last break. Yep. Um, I, he said he could join 3 o'clock, 3.30. Which and is I, it? Well, 3.30. I'll just say 3.30. But if he can join earlier, I told him that you would put him in the waiting room so that he's um, yeah and you should let me know i'm not paying attention to who's joining in so um he needs to let you know hey i'm dialing in you let me know and then i can get him in the waiting room um and we'll see how things are flowing around then but he should get on as soon as he can yes. um so closer to three is better than 3 30. yes all right anything else mr costello no, from the anything else from the defense oh, yeah. oh, all right thank you <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you my favorite cheese, but he's not going to tell you, so he might not be able to tell you.